All right, good morning, everyone. Um, we are going to start the meeting again this morning. It's 8.05 a.m. on Saturday. What is the date today? June 26th. And this is a continuation of our uh, strategic planning session. Lauren, we don't have any new citizen comments, do we? We repeat their comments. Thank you. So, Brian, I think it's all yours. All right, thank you, Mayor. So, uh, today, day two, um, and remember, be here extra early tomorrow morning uh, for day three. Um, and we're going to take a uh, reading this evening. going to be here. All right. So, uh, today, this morning, we're going to continue on with our department reviews and discussions. Um, and uh, given what happened yesterday, probably we did that a little faster. We have some things that we can slide around. And um, if we get down a little early, that's fine. So at this point, we're going to start and jump straight into that. Um, you should have been getting some answers from some of the questions that came in yesterday, so watch your emails. I'm uh, sure we'll be doing that again early next week for any questions that may have come up today. Uh, so today, we're going to go ahead and start with our library director, uh, Laura Turner. She is going to be our first victim, and then, uh, and then we'll have uh, everybody else lined up. So Laura, oh, you got one? Uh, good morning. I'm uh, Laura Turner, Director of the Library. I'm here with Phil Barrett, who's the Library Services Manager. Uh, so first I'd like to start out with a reminder of the importance of the public library. So in a municipality you have entities like fire, police, and public works. And those entities act as the meat and the vegetables. They are vital to a city's existence. Whereas the public library acts as a seizing. While it's not necessary for existence, it does make a nourishing meal more enjoyable. And the spice that the library provides makes relic more appealing and builds a great sense of community. And besides, who likes bland food? <laughs> So I'm going to start out with some highlights. Um, way back in October of 2019, we did a facilities assessment in anticipation of the new library that we're going to have several years down the road. Um, along with surveys, we had two public focus groups. We met with our architect, Maureen Arndt, of 720 to design to determine what it is that the public is looking for, what are their expectations, what is it that they don't want at the library. Um, we got a lot of really good feedback. And then in January of 2020, our director, Kathy Fryheit, retired. I was named the interim director. Then life changed dramatically March 16th of 2020 because the library closed due to COVID. And even though we didn't really know what was going on, what was going to happen, um, the staff adapted. Um, we began issuing temporary digital access library cards. Um, people could get library cards for our digital materials without ever stepping foot in the library. We adapted our story times to be virtual on Facebook. And then we also had um, on social media challenges for young and old and virtual activities. Our GED and ESL classes continued via telephone and Zoom. And then on April 27th, we began to offer curbside checkouts to our patrons. May 26th, we opened to the public with limited hours and we continued the curbside checkout service. Um, we were the first non-emergency city of our the city facility opening after COVID. Um, and that was because the citizens needed their spice. They needed us. Um, that year, uh, we conducted our summer reading program virtually. And then um, into fiscal year 2021, uh, in October, we were able to begin operating under our normal hours um, with two public computers. We had um, we were limiting the time that patrons were in the library to 30 minutes. We had no seating. Um, I was named the director officially. Then November through March, um, because we couldn't do in-person programs, 
We have crafts and STEM activities to go. And uh, we also offered a bookmark contest for the kids for MLK Day and Earth Day. In April of 2021, we were able to discontinue the time limits on patron visits. We were able to start up offering seating in our cafe area. And we added uh, two more computers for a total of four computers with plexiglass barriers between them. In May of 2021, we reinstated our senior book club. Um, our first meeting, we had eight participants who were very, very anxious to start meeting with people again in person and doing things in person. And we're planning on having the author visit us in July. Um, so if you're interested, Marie Warden will be at our book club July 7th at 1 p.m. here at the RCC. Um, in May, we were also able to reinstate our cell check machines and our public access catalogs, <coughs> provide additional seating, open our study room, and have a total of eight computers available. Um, our summer reading program is going well. We're focusing on rewards and engagement. Uh, we're flexing the program sizes according to the participants. Um, baby, since babies are harder to control on the younger children, we're trying to limit that more than we would maybe a senior or an older person program. Um, our kickoff on June 12th hosted 250 kids. The program runs from June 12th to July 31st. And our first week, we had 169 participants. Recent enhancements, um, we have continued with curbside checkouts. Uh, we got a lot of really good positive feedback about it. Busy parents with little ones who don't want to get their kids out of the car and then back into the car. Seniors with mobility issues. Um, it's really, really convenient to just bring their materials out to them. Um, during the, uh, the height of COVID when we were closed and when a lot of libraries were closed, our um, integrated library services software, um, they implemented a uh, auto renewal of materials, which has been really convenient for patrons. Um, if, a, if an item is on reserve for another person, it won't automatically renew that. But if it is part, if they're able to renew that, because when you check out an item, you can renew it two times, the system will automatically do that for patrons. Um, we also implemented Gabby, which allows us to communicate by text with our patrons through our integrated library uh, system. We uh, upgraded our TumbleBook service to TumbleBook Premium, and TumbleBook is ebooks for children, offering games, educational games, um, interactive ebooks that either read to them or assist them with reading. And so we, uh, we upgraded that to a, a version that also offers math and graphic novels. Um, we now have plexiglass barriers in between our computer stations, and we were able to obtain that through a CARES Act grant. Um, we worked a lot with um, our grant coordinator, Ronald, and um, we had applied for the CARES Act grant through the Texas State Library which gave us those uh, partitions between our computers. It also enabled us to get 15 Wi-Fi hotspots that we can now check out to patrons. So we're in the process now of working out the, finalizing the, the policies for that. So we'll be talking to David Berman and our library advisory board to finalize how the checkouts on that are going to go. Is it going to be one per family, how long of a checkout will that take. Um, so we're looking forward to being able to help bridge that digital divide by letting people check out Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, we also applied for a new directions grant with Relic PD, and that's uh, allowing us to get a database called A to Z database. That will provide marketing information for small businesses, job search information, people search information for trying to get people connected with their support network better. Um, unfortunately, we did not receive a grant from the Texas State Library or the National Endowment for the Humanities, but we are still waiting on work from a grant from Dollar General um, for 
more Wi-Fi hotspots that come with tablets. Um, when we have um, spoken with um, peer libraries, they have recommended to try to get different types of hotspots to see which work best in your community. And that's the reason why we're pursuing that through grant applications. Because it is a bit of an experimental program, we felt more comfortable experimenting with kind of grant dollars than the, the tax dollars of the citizens. Um, so the pandemic forced us to reconsider a lot about our programs and how we define success for our program. Um, is success how many kids we can cram into the activity room? Or is success the level of quality and the level of inspiration, so to speak, that participants get in a program? So we decided that we wanted to focus more on quality and that we want our programs to be more inspiring. We need more seasoning in our programs. So we're asking for an additional 7,000 to provide the level of programs that will have quality, inspiration, especially for our after-school programs. We're currently spending $16 per participant per program, and this would increase it to 17 per program, or per person per program. Um, our plan right now for after-school for the fall, because we have to have a few different strategies tried out for the, the COIL students and the influx of students. So what we were wanting to do was try to contain them in the activity room, so to speak, um, give them a small lesson. When we polled them, they basically said, we're tired at the end of the day. We've been in school all day, we're tired, we're kind of hungry, but we mostly want to charge our phones and socialize. So we thought if we could entice them into the activity room, provide a place for them to relax, charge their phones, maybe give them about 15 minutes of a life lesson. Here's how you tie a necktie. Here's how you address a letter. Job operation. Here's how you fill that out. Catch them with that, and we're trying to work with um, getting a grant or some community uh, donations or something to also have snacks for them because we think we'll have more leverage with the teens with food, because everybody knows teens like food. Teens like food. Um, so uh, while that's going on, then each day, we would have one day a children's program, one day a tween program, and one day a teen program that would be more focused on STEM, robotics, something where it would be participants that really, really want to sit down and learn something. And so that would be happening in the conference room in a quieter atmosphere while the teens are in the activity room. So that's kind of our plan for the after school programs. So the 7,000, it's our only request. I um, hope you consider this request for funding to start up our library programs. And at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Laura, I have a question. I, the um, author visit in July, I tried to find it on your website while you were talking, but I didn't want to spend a lot of time. What day and what time, and who's the author? It is, and thank you for pointing that out, because as you say that, I don't believe we have. I don't think it's on your we website. We don't have that. Thank you. It will be on July 7th, and it's at 1 p.m. It's here at the RCC. His name is Rebus Wortham, and his book is called The Rock Hole. It's a mystery. It's called what? The Rock Hole. He is a former Garland ISD teacher. Oh, okay. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Um, any questions, Council? 
Um, you made me turn that mic on. I didn't know what you were going to do. Um, so, uh, thank you for that presentation. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the GEP program um, and whether it's, you know, is it worth continuing that program? What are your thoughts on that? So, that is one thing. Whenever we, um, whenever we did the PBE, we went into that with a lot of trepidation because it does highlight the expense of the GED program. We have, we've looked into other options that people have in what we do. We could defer people to a local community college. There is a greater expense for the community college, but also they're in a class. What they get with us we have a GED coordinator, and we have volunteer tutors that work one-on-one -on -one with the students. And so this, they get individual instruction, but they also get motivation. Um, one thing that, in speaking with our coordinator, that we've seen is, especially when people are trying to raise a family or deal with life and get their GED, it's easy to forget about the GED. It's easy to let that fall off. And our coordinator works really well with their support network in, she will call your mom, she will call your husband, she will call your children and say, hey, so-and-so is not going to class. We need to get them back to class. What can we do to connect with the student? And so while it is a more significant cost, we don't see any other program that has the potential that it's shown to give somebody a, the ability to earn up to $10,000 a year more, which GED does. Studies have shown that that earning potential significantly increases once you have that. And so we feel that that's important to, to contribute to our economy, to have those people not missing out on that. Um, and so that's why we, we feel like it's important to continue with that because um, we have had that conversation about the concerns of it is an expensive program, but we feel like it's worth it because it has such a significant impact on that person's life. Um, can you explain that? Do, do we charge for that class? Or is it, is it, no, no, it's a free class. Um, and how many do we usually get annually participants? Uh, last year we had um, sorry, let me get to the GED program. Um, last year we had 20 people graduating that. Now that was also getting tutored by Zoom and phone, which I think is kind of significant. Um, we are trying to work on getting more through the program, getting more information about the program happening. Um, did I speak that right, Phil? Am I? Is 20 low or is 20 high? From 20, I think 20 is high. Um, we have had, when I when I started working here eight years ago, there were times when we had one to zero. Yeah. Just thinking about that constant or current view for your great job, hey, increasing the number of book participants. Hey, sir, you're going to have to wrap uh, Sorry, I had faith in my ability to speak loudly, but I guess not. Uh, so, Constance has done a really great job of both increasing the number of people in the program, but also the graduates speaking to what Laura was saying on. Engage in the support network and all that, do a really good job there. And uh, even through doing things through Zoom on the phone, we still kept a pretty good particip participation rate. But now that we're able to open things back up, bring them back in, all of our meeting rooms are open, or all the conference room is open again, we're confident that we can increase that number, which then the cost per person goes down because we don't have people in here. So that part of it is a bit less wins and Thank you for explaining that. Um, 
Um, has there been any consideration to have a low cost uh, charge? I mean, I don't know if that's that's been something that's been discussed or if that's even a good idea. It's something we could take into consideration and look at for the future to help offset that cost. Do we limit it to wildlife residents? No, we do not. So, so do you have an analysis of what, how much is wildlife residents versus surrounding communities? I can provide that for you, but I don't have that at this Which time. Which you can hold it for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I think it's an important program. Um, I know it's an expensive program uh, per, per individual, um, but I'm not, I'm not so sure we should be using wildlife taxpayer dollars to have a program for non wildlife residents. Mm -hmm. That's a little, you know, I, I, I hate to say that, but I think we need to grow the program for our residents and not support surrounding resident, surrounding communities with our taxpayer dollars. <coughs> I don't know how you all feel about that. Is that a fixed cost? In other words, no matter how many students you have, is this, uh, well, right at 57,000, is that a fixed cost? That cost, um, I believe it would decrease if we had more students because we would have, the cost of the coordinator would not increase, the cost of the, because the tutors are free, you know, and so it's, it's um, that cost would, would decrease because it's taking into account kind of the facility and, and mm -hmm. things like that. So your cost per student would change, but I, I guess what I'm asking <clears throat> is, is the cost of the program the same no matter how many students you have? Yes, that's okay. Um, so just to repeat that with the microphone, the, the question and answer was the cost of the program remains the same regardless of how many students you have. Yes. But, but, I, but I do think it's important that we're using our taxpayer dollars for our residents. Absolutely. Even, even with the answer to that question. I don't think you were applying something else. No, it wasn't. Martha answered, no, she wasn't. Laura, are there supplies per student? Do you have to purchase certain supplies? So if I'm a student and I enroll in your GED program, do you purchase supplies specific to me? I don't believe we do not. Okay. So, yes. Cost does remain the same because it doesn't cost per student. That overhead is set overhead if they have one student or if they have 25 students. Yeah, and it's important to know that that overhead is there regardless um, because the instructors are uh, volunteers, right? I mean, right. if we if we eliminated the program, we don't eliminate fifty-seven thousand dollars in cost because a lot if, of this facility. If we eliminated the program, um, we would lay off our GED coordinator. So there would be that cost significance, but as far as the facility cost, it would still be there. Yeah, thank you, Laura. Did you get that all answered? Thank you. It has been quite a journey for you all this last year, and we've said it before, but it, it bears uh, importance to say again, you guys have done a wonderful job. You continue to do a wonderful job for this community, and we thank you so much, and our community thanks you so much. Thank you, Mary. You're up.
when we got over there, the now they're about 15 minutes. No. <laughs> so, but true, I mean, a lot of times they do, they find them in the house. But they got that hot and away. And you only have one shoe on. So we found them because with the heat out there, Everybody ready? Yeah, you nervous? Yes. <laughs> we'll try to make it worse. <laughs> <laughs> we might get worse. We got the questions. to be here. I'm Aaron Cleaver. I'm the director for the Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, my assistant director, Kara Pacheco, is here as well. She's here for moral support and to help me answer any questions that you help with. So, uh, again, thank you guys for allowing us to present to you uh, this morning. It's good to be back. It's good to see everybody. Um, so, that being said, we will get right into it. So, a few years ago, the department established a department focus, or basically why we are important. Uh, so we have continued to focus on those five uh, things. So the first one is tourism, um, with the special events and the Powerpoint Park and Congrove Park, what zone, we're drawing in people from surrounding cities to participate in things that we offer. So. That is one aspect. Uh, the second aspect is juvenile crime prevention. So through partnerships with the police department, uh, offering our summer programs, our spring break programs, athletics, uh, things that will allow youth and teens to participate in programs, just helps us keep them busy, keep them off the streets, keep them engaged in things that they really wouldn't be able to participate in on a daily basis. Third is Aaron Quality. Uh, happy to say that for the 18th year in a row, we are have been recognized as a Tree City USA program. So that is outstanding. We hopefully will be going on year 19, so to continue that trend. Uh, so Texas Summers, trees are important. Trees help contribute to air, air quality. So we continue to focus on planting, replanting, uh, making sure we're staying in line with that as well. Health benefit services, uh, parks. We encourage parks users to get out, to utilize our amenities, walk the trails, uh, use anything that they can, playgrounds, just to increase health. And then lastly is benefits of property value. So they said that the closer you live to a park or in proximity increases your value in 20% by tax revenue. So those, those are all aspects that we continue today to focus on, move forward with, and just continue to, to put it flat. So last year was a challenging year, uh, 2021 successes. As most of you guys know, we had to modify a lot of our special events. Um, so we were basically planning three events at once. So we had a plan A, we had a plan B, and we had a plan C. Um, started with our drive-in movies. We went from having movies in the park or movies on the lawn to doing drive-in movies, uh, which was a huge success. Um, basically, was we allowed everybody to come in, sit in our cars, old school style. Um, obviously with limitations, uh, but we averaged probably 25, 30 cars a night, so that was a plus. Our trunk or treat was another one we had to modify. We went from everyone circling cars from downtown to people staying in their cars circling the booths, so that was different and that was a lot of fun too. So we, we had a lot of participants that came through. Uh, instead of canceling our important ceremonies, our Memorial Day, our Veteran Day ceremonies, we did virtual. 
So while we continue to offer them, we take them, we video them, we still provided those recognition for those that have served, so for those that sacrificed their lives. So that was important for us to continue to do that. We just had to modify some uh, different things. And then lastly was our scavenger hunt that we offered uh, in last fall. So uh, staff retreats um, continues to be an important goal of ours. Um, it's important for us to really hear what our staff says. So each fall we offer retreats for our individual divisions. So we have a parks retreat, we have a recreation retreat, and then after that we do a leadership retreat which includes all of our supervisors. And during that retreat we just talk about, basically summarize what all of the team talked about. So we talk about wants, needs, trainings, uh, projects, you know, what they need help with. So we're allowing them to really engage with us and talk to us and provide us you know, with what's going to make their lives a little easier, what makes it going to make it more efficient, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes as well. Um, one of the big things we've also started to roll out is servant leadership. So, as a as a as a team executive and senior leadership, we started doing servant leadership trainings. So, we actually started to roll that down to our supervisors as well as some of our crew leaders just to talk about servant leadership. And they meet monthly um, just to go over different chapters. They assign different um, projects and chapters to each group, and they come and they talk about it. So everyone is engaged. Everyone kind of understands what servant leadership is about and how they continue or how we continue to move forward. Um, continuing your youth athletic leagues was successful. Kids want to play. Kids just want to play. So, in spite of that, we, we let them play. We put some things into, into a modification mode. We assigned kind of seating reservations, if you will, which are boxes on the ground at the baseball field. So, um, we had to keep those parents. For some, it was good. Um, for some, as, as you probably can imagine, we're disagreeing, but to keep everyone safe and for us to be able to continue to offer that was awesome. So the kids loved it. We, we did the, the, the fall baseball league. We also took our indoor youth volleyball league and moved it to community park and did the same volleyball league instead of canceling it. So that was a great opportunity for those that really wanted to play uh, volleyball. We, through COVID, we continued our seven days a week service. Um, while it was a strain on our park staff, we were still able to offer the seven day a week. So that was nice to help stay on top of that and keep us moving forward to get us prepared for the week. So that was another plus. And then lastly, our implementation of our employee recognition and appreciation program. Um, that actually was one of the things that we had uh, really were eager to implement. So show and tell. I have to show everybody. So this is our gold chain award. This is our recreation division award. Um, we're still waiting on the medallion to come in, so that's why we're doing that. So each month the rec division uh, nominates three or four people for the rec division award, whether it's they did something nice, they went above and beyond, um, did something extraordinary. Their, their teammates can nominate them for that award. And then the other award is, this is our Digging for Success Award. So it's basically just a gold shovel. It's a shovel I found in my garage. Oh, okay. <laughs> so basically what we did is, um, to make things fun, to, to be creative. I know the guys thought it was a little corny at first, um, but I think they bought into it and they love it. Um, our first winner, Alan Ryan Meyer, has been here a little over 20 years, maybe 25 years, so I get caught him a little off guard. But they're kind of the same process. Their peers nominate them, so it's more of a peer-to-peer -peer recognition rather than us saying, hey, you did a good job. 
So they're recognizing each other, which is a great program. So we have gone on our third shovel award. Uh, this last month we gave it to everybody just because of the unfortunate circumstance that we went through as a department. So uh, most of the guys, all of the guys stepped up to kind of help them with that. So lots of fun. So some of our current challenges that we have, obviously the staffing. We really struggled at the beginning of the year for what zone to find lifeguards. I think he, uh, he's just about where he needs to be uh, just to help alleviate some of the current guards that they have just to uh, help relieve them. And then as well as our, our parks division too as, as well. So trying to find them MS1s to come in at the basic level has been a challenge. Uh, another challenge is our new parks coming online, Hereford Park, uh, Lakefront and Pecan Grove, and the most recently started Lake Highlands Trail Project. Uh, just trying to keep those things maintained um, with the people, with the supplies, with the equipment is going to be a challenge. Uh, department marketing, as you guys know, currently um, we're in the process of hiring a special events and event coordinator. That person basically takes on all of the department marketing, social media, making flyers, uh, keeping up with the website, but also planning the 25 special events that we offer each year. So it's definitely a challenge for, for that person. And then lastly, the addition of amenities uh, without maintenance staff and funding, uh, new courts, new fields, new parks, and then the biggest one was COVID-19. So, so getting right into our requests, we have four different requests. Our first request is $60,959 to seal the porn place and make additional repairs at Kids Kingdom. As most of you guys know, that is the highest, highest utilized facility in the city that, that the Parks and Department has. Kids are there from sun up to sundown. Um, the picture on the left, I know it's kind of difficult to see, but this is the zip line. So you can see the areas that are now starting to wear out along with some of the additional areas uh, throughout the playground. So what we will do is we will actually make repairs to all of this. This will be removed so that we can uh, look at replacing all of this as well as some of the other spots. And then with pour in place, it needs a seal. So basically what you're doing is if you've ever put a puzzle together and you put hodgepodge over top, if you know what hodgepodge is, that's basically what it's doing. So it's like a glue that helps seal uh, the pour in place material which keeps the life for about four or five years. Now you have to do that every four or five years just to maintain the quality of the porn place. Hey, Aaron. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I'm trying to get the microphone. Ah, microphone challenge. I will yell. Um, so, um, so you're going to replace it with the same surface that's currently there? So what we're doing, so the area beneath the zip line, so the area beneath the zip line, we're currently looking at some, some cost differentials because what we thought about doing was seeing what it would take to replace the porn place and the current mulch with turf, which is what we currently have at Springfield Park. Okay. So... Let me, let me ask my whole question. So why are we talking about uh, pour in place and sealant? Was that the other places? I'm confused. And are we currently sealing it and we missed something? So when we originally put it in, we did not seal it. Um, so we would have to replace the pour in place there for sure, which is the, the surface. And there are some other spots that really need to be repaired as well. So those will be included in those repairs. So then once they made those repairs, we would have to go in and reseal where they repaired the porn place, um, as well as the existing porn place that we have. Why didn't we seal it? 
And you try. I do not know the answer to why we didn't, but I can tell you that Corn Place does have to be resealed about every five years, um, and this is not uncommon for five years of use, especially for a playground that is used as heavily as Kids Kingdom. Um, you wouldn't see holes quite as big as you see, but you do have to, about every five years, invest about $60,000 on Corn Place to have it repaired and have it resealed. Is, is it worth, uh, this is crazy, but is it worth eventually replacing the entire surface with something that is not going to cost $60,000 every five years? Everything has a maintenance cost associated. Um, you'd be about $60,000 to $200,000 surface. Mm -hmm. So if you do the maintenance you need on an ongoing basis, it will last 20 years. But it costs fifty dollars to $60,000 every five years. And maybe at this playground every three and a half to four years based on use alone um, to keep it up and running. So so the turf, is turf more a more reliable surface than the... Uh, this is. Like the grass. So, so turf, turf is a little, yes, um, takes less maintenance. Now there are some things that you still have to do with it. So like you have to, to brush it. So it's just like a carpet in your house when you walk on it, it flattens out. So you would have to go back in and you brush it every six months to a year and then add the filler, whether it's sand or the rubber pellets or whatever. So and it could be more cost effective to do turf. We would just have to do the research for that. Yeah, a lot of our issue at Kids Kingdom is just sheer number of people. There aren't many playgrounds anywhere in the Metroplex that get the number of people that Kids Kingdom gets every single day. Yeah, I understand that. I just think, uh, the, obviously, we missed the mark on not having it sealed, um, which is why it's probably in this really rough condition on top of all the usage it gets. So, we wanted to ask. Yeah, so I would just like to make a comment because I know uh, I'm, I'm looking at this picture of um, some of the missing pieces actually of this surface, and that's a huge trip hazard uh, to me. And so, uh, you know, it just kind of emphasizes the fact that we have got to build in maintenance uh, in all of these improvements that we do in any, any other parts, whether it's playground equipment or shade structures or whatever, it's one thing to initially purchase those items, but we have got to be more proactive uh, instead of reactive uh, when these things tear apart and then you've got to come to us and ask for um, money to, to do maintenance on these services. And I just, I, I think we really need to dig a little deeper um, as we purchase these items so that you guys will have what you need to maintain them. And, um, then, you know, to, um, uh, to everyone else's point, just wondering if this is the best service um, that is available uh, for that kind of high traffic. When we put it in, it was the best service for that. Time. And things changed, and they did. Six years ago, you know, things are different today than they were in 2015 when we started planning this and developing it. And turf might be the answer now. I don't know if they have used turf in this high traffic of an area and what the long-term effect to turf will be on 150 kids a day using that area that you see right there. So, I mean, even mulch, which mulch will hold up to just about anything, they beat the crud on mulch when there was mulch there, which is why we put in the pour in place. So I, the mulch just, was awful, and I'm so glad they had a solid surface. Yeah, it's a real are, challenge. No, there are other kids there at eight thirty in the morning. Yeah. Well, you know, obviously we need to need to do this and, and make it safe and get it repaired uh, and protect the investment that we have made already. But um, I would like to explore. You know, what's what's the latest and the greatest? Because um, technology does change, 
And uh, as much as that playground is used, I think it's worth exploring uh, and bringing something to council, maybe for the 2023 budget. But, uh, but I'm, I'm all in favor of getting this sealed and prepared so, uh, so that it's safe and in good condition. I didn't mean to hurry you, Martha. I thought I was being helpful coming to get the microphone. Um, so I agree with that, with what Martha just said. I, I think it's important to get this repaired and get this sealed because there's there's quite a bit of life left in the surface. There's a huge hole, which you can see, um, and then this wear and tear. But that's pretty repairable, and then minimal cost of sealing. And then let's let's think about you know how much longer that's going to last and maybe in two or three or four years there's a whole other surface but I would hate to give up on this surface when it has just some repair work that needs to be done and quite a bit of useful life still left that's just my personal opinion I got a, just an easier question for you the uh, the surface whatever the surface is doesn't it have to be uh, relatively soft yeah, depending on is it a fall height? Fall zones. Fall zones, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. It, had, it can't be just anything. It's right. It's got to be a surface that they can fall on without breaking. Yes. I know when I'm around the zip line, I don't want to fall on the <laughs> So I'm assuming that none of the other areas of the park are still either. So what? Uh, what is... Could y'all look at the cost of what it would take to seal the entire playground so that we can extend the life? It is the entire. Oh, that is. Oh, yeah, okay. it's the entire playground. Okay, well then that's good enough. Okay. That's repairs and seal the entire playground. Okay. Yes. That's good. Thank you. And do that quickly. That is a hazard. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, no, I tripped over. Uh, request number two uh, is for a contract and compliance coordinator. Uh, basically, what this position is right now currently is one of our PMS2 positions is basically monitoring um, and evaluating our mowing contracts. So, in conjunction with Carrie and, and Matt and I, that position would help us evaluate uh, mowing locations, um, you know, continue to measure if needed. Because you know things are popping up, areas are popping up that we we haven't mowed previously, or we've mowed and then we stopped mowing. Um, but this is a very detailed position, and what it's currently doing is taking our PMS two away from some other park operations that he could be doing. So what he's doing is he's visiting with citizens about mowing complaints. He's going and verifying that these contractors are indeed mowing the areas that they say they're mowing. Um, so it's it's taking a lot, of t a lot of his time to really focus on that area. And as you guys know, from March through basically September, October, it's mowing season. And he helps with the medians. He helps with um, uh, everything as far as the aspects of mowing go. And the off season is when we really evaluate and we look at the mowing contracts and make any adjustments that we need to make. Uh, and then also he works with off season spraying. So this position really, really focuses on those elements of uh, mowing and spraying just for the beautification, if you will. So he holds them accountable for everything that they're doing. Uh, so it would just be um, an added bonus for us. Request number three is a workman uh, multifunctional cart. We currently have one of these. These these carts are very very important and essential, and I say that because they can reach areas that some of our little Colorado trucks or our new trucks will not be able to reach. They have a dump bed on them. So especially with Lake Collins Trail coming online, it would be easier for staff to get up and down the trails in one of these to pick up trash, cut limbs, transfer, you know, fill holes, they can put dirt in the bed, they dump it. So it's it's very important. They can use it for irrigation repairs, uh, trail clearings, like if we have to go to the nature trail and clear, clear limbs from the trail. 
it's just easy for them to get up and down on the trail for that as well. And then lastly, it is our Caterpillar rubber track loader. We have one of these as well, but we use this all of the time. Um, we like these track loaders compared to the wheel loaders because it's less damaging on the turf. It will allow us to get to um, more wet, if you will, land if we have to use it for dumping dirt conditioner onto the infield. It's, it's less damaging. So it acts more like a tank, if you will, and it doesn't create many ruts. So this will help us save money in the long run because what we currently have to do is, if they're using it at a community park and we need it to take it to the trail to fill in some of the holes that are on the trail, we have to wait until that, that project is done at community. So this would be ideal for us. We would use it two or three times a week, basically on a, on a yearly basis. And also they have uh, accessories that you could buy, stump grinders, um, trenching, things like that well, that will allow us to be more efficient in some of the stuff that we have to do. So this is our priority order, if you will. The, our porn place, number one. Our compliance coordinator, number two. The multifunctional dump bed cart, number three. And the rubber track loader, number four. And that is all for now. Questions? I have questions. I have the microphone, so I'll start. Um, I've talked to Angie about this several times. I don't know if I've said it in a council meeting. Um, I just really would like us to look at our Memorial Day event and see if we can put Touch a Truck somewhere else that's more um, appropriate. Um, it's a Memorial Day event. It's not a kid's um, fair. I hate to lose touch a truck, so if there's somewhere else we could put it, I think that's my personal opinion. I know that um, Brian Wilbur brought in, you know, vintage military equipment that one year, and that is that's something that um, I know he had a vision to do that repetitively, and then COVID hit, so I haven't talked to him about it in over a year. But something like that that could bring people in is, is more appropriate, in my opinion, than kids you know, running all over uh, equipment on a Memorial Day event. Right. So I don't know how you all feel about that. So uh, going a little further to that, um, instead of a touch a truck, we can do a public, a public safety day, or something like that. I know we used to have that years and years ago. Sure. Um, and it was like a public safety expo, and you had, you know, pretty much the same exact equipment that you had out there, you know, including public works uh, vehicles and parks vehicles. Um, so maybe you just make it uh, its own event, and I think if you brand it as a public safety day, I think you'll get even more interest in that. Yeah, I would just be careful about that because then you have tents and you have music and you have, I just, you know, we got a Memorial Day event where we're memorializing, and that theme needs to carry through. Again, personal opinion, but that's details. Public safety event is a good event too. Yeah, separate. Yeah. Separate. Separate. Anyway, yeah. it wasn't he talking about his event be separate? Yeah. Separate day. Separate. Oh, okay. I thought you missed instead of touch and truck. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Um, and then I, I, I think we're lacking pretty significantly in this community of not having some kind of an MLK event. Um, I've asked DB and I to look at that, but um, that couldn't. That's hard for it's hard for a commission to start up a new event. And I, I know you all partner with Diversity Day with DB and I. I, I would like us to look at, it doesn't have to be a big thing. Um, we can start off small. We can ask the schools to have, you know, kids write essays and, you know, our Arts and Humanities Commission picks, you know, first, second, and third place. And, you know, DE&I is part of, you know, that organization. I just feel like we're, 
we need to do something for MLK. Um, so, any other comments there? And since now Juneteenth is an official holiday, I've had several people approach me about that. Okay. About we did light up the water tower with uh, uh, Juneteenth colors, so I'm that's good. That. Yeah. yeah, they brought that to my team. Yeah, but I think it's some kind of, you know, event at the at the tower, you know, to memorialize Juneteenth. I know we can't do everything, but that's an important one. Maybe that's a day you could do touch a truck. Touch a truck a bit. <laughs> I think we need a touch a truck day. <laughs> yeah. I'm just trying to think of a, you know, a large event with booths and all this other stuff. And yeah. Trucks could be there. We definitely don't want to do touch a truck on MLK day, I don't think. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you got to consider when the holiday is, too. MLK is middle of January, so chances are it's going to be cold. You know, whatever you do, so. It's hard to do an outside event when it may be snowing, you know. But, but MLK could be, you know, an essay contest. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be an outside Right, event. I'm just saying, you got to consider the, the time of year it is. We're not taking this away if you haven't noticed. <laughs> no, we're not going to move We're not going to get any stuff like We figured 25 right. events was right. not right. enough. You need no, more. Need to be okay, <laughs> so in your department focuses, you have one for tourism. Are you tracking the number of non residents that use our park system? So that particularly use our park system, we are not. But well, so how are you measuring tourism as a department focus where you're attracting non residents to our systems? Through our special events and through all our programs. So basically what, what we do is we do evaluation forms. So we go, and that's one of the questions is zip code and are you a resident? So what do, do you publish those stats or are those stats? We will be publishing those stats. Now that we are back to 100%, if you will, we can, we can now get back to tracking all of that information. And then I, we will be conducting a monthly report that will have that information in it. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, guys. Um, on your additional needs, if just a thought, if we're going to be having a conversation about potential re-putting the parts back on a future bond, we might want to look at some of these additional deferred maintenance needs that are big capital expenses that might need to be put on there as well. Just a thought. That's a good point, Matt. Um, so thinking about the touch truck, I wonder if, uh, would that be uh, logistically too tough to incorporate with the July 4th event? Okay. Yes. <laughs> we have all staff on deck working that day. We have to have all staff working to make the equipment. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. I think it would be, but I think it would be a good fit if, if it were possible. But you sure um, could promote a downtown market day with a touch of truck. Yes, you could. There are a yeah. lot of places to so Yeah, that would be, that would be awesome. Um, so, um, just to comment about Juneteenth, I know I've been in touch with, um, with Dorothy Brooks and Garland, who is, um, does a lot of activism there. And uh, I know that the churches and possibly the city of Marlin will be in touch with us about doing a Juneteenth uh, celebration that's in partnership uh, in the region. So I'm kind of excited about that. Um, and some of the churches also and nonprofits um, just participating in that partnership. Um, and then uh, I wanted to talk about uh, the uh, median on 66. I uh, just wanted to make sure that, you know, I know that we uh, allocated some funds that have not been previously allocated for the maintenance uh, of that and wondered how that was working out. I know that um, we were going to kind of do half of the maintenance through the contract and then half of it with parks. I know you guys were spread very thin and uh, how's that working out or, or your parks guys being able to get to it? Do we need to allocate more um, 
through a contract. And then also, uh, I wondered where we were at. We allocated some one-time funding for replacement of dead plants. And, uh, and that was even before we had snowmageddon that killed a lot of stuff. So uh, just wondered where we were at on that plant replacement and also how that uh, contract was working out. So first, the contract. Um, they got behind. Um, the contractors got behind. So we were trying to do what we could with the medians, with the staff that we had. Um, Ryan, who was the one who basically is you know, overseeing a lot of that stuff has really stayed on the contractor, pushed the contractor, held, them, held their feet to the fire basically to make sure that they continue to do what they do. And I don't, they've been out the last few weeks um, covering the medians, the contractors have, covering the medians, picking up trash, uh, they were trimming. Uh, so they're getting back to where they were. I think a lot of it was um, some personnel issues that they have, that the contractors were having. No excuses by any means. Um, but I think that's what we were running into with them. But they have assured us they have gotten back to where they need to be and they will, they will get back to what they agreed to do with the medians. Um, secondly, as far as the pipe replacement goes, correct me if I'm wrong, but we were waiting for the cold snap to come now we're almost to July, but we've been checking irrigation, uh, trying to figure out what is going to be the best material to put in there because we don't want to put, you know, the bushes that were that were in there that they had to, to clear. So um, I know Ryan also was working on that along with Matt, our person and facility superintendent, to get that stuff in, in planted and replaced as well. Right, I did just want to make sure that you guys have what you need uh, for that to look really great uh, because it's kind of like our foyer uh, in a way when you walk into the house. I mean, it's a, it's a major thoroughfare for our city and we want it to look good and give you guys what you need uh, to keep it looking good. I know that we uh, have, I think it was around $50,000 in cost savings on mowing and I would assume that some of that uh, is due to the drought tolerant plantings and such that are on 66 that don't have to be mowed now, and maybe we can allocate some of that funding to maintaining it. I think that savings you're going to see, Martha, is a lot in the actual mowing and is not tied directly to Highway 66. Okay. So when we did the Green River project, we increased maintenance in that. So they went from just mowing like one strip to having a high maintenance. Congratulations to you, Aaron. You know, I'm moving into that position. I, I think you've just done it seamlessly, and uh, our parks look great. Thank you. I just wanted to add um, so the just to, to note, um, there are quite a lot of dead trees in the median. I know that that's just the winter storm that just tickets told. So that's just to watch for. Also, I noticed, and, and this just may be how they do weed control, um, but there's like 
green dye. So you can tell where they store yeah. it. Yeah. Right. Right. Know where they right. Right. Yeah. I guess that's what that is, right? Okay, I just want to be sure. I'm like, is somebody like spray painting or eating? <laughs> that's a Right. So, okay, thank you. Anything else, anyone? What? We oh, have, we oh. have basketball leagues going on today, so all the screaming and the hollering they hear is our summer league basketball program. Mm -hmm. so, Joey was trying to help, but that's not an option. <laughs> so I just want to say, Aaron, you're getting more comfortable in front of us every time. She's <laughs> good. We're pretty rough. I'm getting there. We're not so scary. No, I had to practice a few times. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Should have worn the chain. Yeah, actually, I was going to, but. Anything else, everybody? All right. Thanks, Parks and Rec. Yep. Next up is Joey with IT. IT, IT.
So the next beat is network switches. So they are now what I call a satellite building. So this building will be a satellite building. It's, it's a building that's not, we don't have a data center in. Um, this building connects back to our data center. And what these switches do is they, they connect to that data center for our fiber. And they allow all the computers, phones, and wireless to work in this building. Um, we have 21 of them throughout the city. Um, and they're going to reach end of life in 2025. Um, so we could wait to 2025 and replace all 21 of them at 160,000. But in order to flatten the budget, I'm recommending doing seven per year um, starting next year, which would be 52,000. Um, and that would be over up until 2025. And, uh, or 2024, I'm sorry. Um, and that would double flatten the budget. This ties into the network management uh, part of this budget program. Strategic programs at the bottom. So the next one is the Wi Fi radios. These again were purchased in 2013. Um, we have 44 of them throughout the various locations that provide the guest and data network that we use. Um, 18 of them will no longer be supported by the manufacturer. And the cost to replace those would be 11000 So the next thing that we're requesting is fiber optic cable discovery. So we do have a fiber optic mat. I did remove um, the markings on this one just for security purposes, but we don't have enough documentation on fiber. We know where it is, we know it goes down the street, but we don't know which side it's on, we don't know how deep it is, we don't know how many strands of the fiber are in that cable that's, that's underground. It is all underground, which is really good, um, but we need to have our fiber vendor come in and discover it. Let us know where everything is, can we GIS, and, and know, um, like I said, how many strains. Like, they're wanting to put some of the new sirens on, on fiber. We should have enough strains to, to cover that, but we need to know what we do. And that's what this would do is, it would basically, basically give us all of that documentation. The next one is the public safety. Public safety system administrator. I used to have this position. Um, I was dedicated to the source of police and fire. Um, I will say that police and fire account for a third of our help desk tickets. Um, they also, we have a separate network for the police department that we have to maintain. Um, it has to, to comply with state security requirements. Um, so when when I moved back to City Hall as IT manager, we took two lieutenants in PD and one guy in fire admin and who wanted to learn IT. And we trained them up, gave them extra access, and they started helping us, I guess, the light lifting for IT for those departments. Um, two of them have retired, um, so we've, we've taken that on. Um, I think we need to add a position dedicated to IT for Use the fire. Um, that's going to be about 86,000. So the next one is how we connect our fire department vehicles to our network and internet. Um, right now, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the MiFi devices, um, it's just like a little talking bug that connects the cellular network and throws a Wi Fi network. Right now, we have consumer grade devices in our fire trucks and ambulances. And um, they're not meant to be in a hot vehicle all day. They're not meant to be on all day. Um, if you see the article in the top right, I've asked for these in the past. Um, so back in 2018, they were having problems where they would get hot and they could start a fire. If you look in the bottom uh, right, last month, they were called 2.5 million due to the fire. So the vendor's not fixing it on their consumer grades. Um, a lot of other agencies do use what I'm asking for, local greater points. Um, they are meant to be in a vehicle all day. And the police department already has them. I think they may have purchased them. Which is your funds, it's about $60,000 for the next one. And the last thing is GIS training. The vendor that uh, we send our two GIS folks to training to 
is just increasing the price by two thousand two hundred fifty dollars. So I need to add that in so that we can continue to stay up to date. And I will stop on the list of priorities, these requests and needs, and entertain these questions. Joey, thank you. Um, I've always thought that it was strange that, that the police department was managing so much of their IT. I, I totally agree that needs to be pulled back into IT. What I would wonder is, you know, that frees up a lot of police resources, and, and what does that do to the police budget? You all will look at that, I'm sure, um, if you decide to do that. But um, so that's the only position you think you need to add right now. Um, that's the only one we can ask for. Right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I appreciate that clarification. Sure. Um, talk to us a little bit about how the uh, without impairing. Uh, Confidential information and security information. How's it? How's the cyber security working out? And how how are you sleeping these days in regards to uh, cyber uh, attacks? A little bit better. Um, the disaster recovery thing um, is huge. It's like I said, we've been hit. We've been hit. And it's going to happen. That now that we can recover, we should be able to recover a little better. Is great. And then you know we did partner with cyber security, cyber security uh, vendor. It was two years ago, and they monitor. We, we send uh, all of the information, uh, all the activity on our network. They monitor it twenty four seven, and then if they see something that uh, kind of raises an eyebrow, they'll investigate it. And then if they think it's actually an actual issue, they'll get us involved, and um, they'll also help us respond to it. So they're not just detecting it and managing it; um, they'll help us fix it when. A lot of the peer cities, uh, my peer cities in this area, have been asking me about that service, and they're starting to move towards it as well. It, it, <coughs> it's, I'm sorry. It seems strange to me that you know hackers can break down a pipeline, um, and yet you know we're a relatively small city. And you're telling us you feel pretty comfortable. Am I, is there, am I in a disconnect here? Me? We're in a really good spot. Um, I, I really think so. I mean, again, the, the disaster recovery, you know, if it happens, we should be covered. We can get back up to where we need to be quicker than we used to be able to. Um, but so, so the answer is the pipeline should have been able to also. It happens. They just don't, they didn't have the, the, the systems in place to recover. That becomes a matter, a matter of whether the executives want to spend the money Take it to Congress. <laughs> what the answer? No. <laughs> you know, you got to love IT. Um, and you need it. And you just come in and they say, hey, we're not, we're not going to support this software anymore. So everybody's got to update it. Makes it pretty easy to come in and do project requests. Um, but you know, you guys do a great job, and my only question is if we update some of the software on the Wi Fi and things like that, does that mean the Wi Fi at City Hall will get better so we can all be on an iPad and actually download it back? You know, <laughs> we can, uh, the, the new radios that will give us uh, Wi Fi 6, which does have better So we would be able to download it back in less sure than five minutes. I'm not sure if that's a website problem because everyone's getting it once. I'm working with our web host to see if that's what it is, um, because when I'm in that same room and you guys are having problems, I do speed tests and our speed is not an issue. Uh, okay. Thank you. Hey, Julia, I do want to say, um, you know, you guys did an amazing job for us um, all through COVID. And uh, just just want to acknowledge how uncomplicated all of that was in a very complicated uh, environment. And so thank you for all the extra and hard work that you guys did to keep us in forward motion. Uh, I only have one comment, and uh, that is with the uh, the vendor map for the uh, fiber. And you know, I would just say, and you're probably doing this anyway. But going forward, um, any contracts that you do where people are laying the fiber, I would make it a requirement of that contract that they provide a map to you 
uh, that shows you exactly where they're laying that fiber. Yeah, so first of all, thanks for the uh, feedback. Um, we couldn't have done that without my team. Um, they, they've done a lot to make sure everyone is happy to be here during all those weird times. Um, but yeah, when, when I became director, I got rid of our, our current fiber vendor because they wouldn't give us that documentation. They wanted to keep it so we it back from them to them when we need it. Okay. I do have someone in place that does that. Excellent. That's all I have. Anybody else? I know, but I just got So, uh, with regards to the uh, fiber discovery, um, I wonder if that could be something that is split through with ARPA funds, because I think that there's, you can fund what, um, broadband uh, systems, is that? Uh, what funds? Or ARPA. Uh, um, and when we get into the ARPA discussion, allocation discussion, there are, I don't know, seven, eight um, broadband projects that Joey has uh, put in there and we'll discuss. Um, there, there, are, there are some odd restrictions about it, um, but investing obviously in our broadband, expanding it, um, there's some, some desire, if not limitation, to, you know, to expand it in areas either that don't have their low income areas. So, there are some odd tricks and tricks. I'll, we can discuss that when we do the LRPA discussion to, uh, today. Okay. Anyone else? I do. I have a comment there. So, um, one thing that I, I wanted to tell you is that, you know, IT oftentimes is an afterthought. Mayor, that's your point, really about what happened back east. Um, you know, and you look at all these organizations over the years, even some that would say that they felt like they had adequate, let's call it adequate, um, cybersecurity, uh, firefighting, um, you know, um, uh, technology, and then they get hit too. Even our own federal government has been hit many times. We were hit years ago with ransomware and what saved us that time was that we had we were using the tapes, and there was um, um, there was um, uh, some older stuff that was not contaminated or corrupted, and we were able to restore from that. So our backup disaster plan is really it's not that maybe we can totally prevent it ever from happening, but we believe that we can recover from it, and that is why. This man is sleeping better at night. But I did want to tell you one thing that we are going to make a change this year. You guys know for years we've talked about what we call our birth, the Vehicle Equipment Replacement Fund. And so although some of that is now going to be moved under the Enterprise Program, we still have our yellow arm. We still have the bigger uh, dump trucks and things like that we still need to account for. And what we call Nirvana is a level amount of funding each year, even though the actual expenditures may change a little bit. So it's a commitment of X dollars a year to make sure that when that truck needs to be fit or replaced or that caterpillar, then we have the money in place to do that. We have not really done that for technology. And so what we did instead is uh, every year we do this. Now, a lot of what's on here is not what you would have put in that kind of a fund. Uh, instead, um, you know, these are these are projects that we see a need and we say we need to do this. But what we want to do is reach Nirvana, just like with the verb for our technology. So we have uh, we challenged Joey uh, to come up with you know all the replacement technology, and, and you know sometimes that gets buried in other departments and then it gets lost. Um, one year you don't fund it, the next thing you know you don't have it anymore. So this brings it, elevates it, makes it more transparent. You guys get to see it. Um, and so we called it initially the TURF, the, the Technology Equipment Replacement Fund. But then we decided to simplify and call it the JERF, Joey's Equipment Replacement Fund. <laughs> but, uh, but that's not going to be a change. We, and to ease into that, to get to a level that provides a level of funding with the exception of, of, of annual CPI, 
one thing that we, there's a really big ticket item, and I can't remember if you had that on your list. Okay, so it's the switches. It's the, uh, it's the memory, it's, it's the hyperconvergent virus. So it's basically the data center is storage, memory, compute, and networking. Um, what he's talking about is three of those, which is memory, compute, and storage. So, um, yeah. So, uh, not to try and talk over Ian's head, but the, the data center typically is, is four things. It's, it's networking for communication, it's storage for files, it's memory and compute to process everything. Um, starting next year, um, we're going to start replacing, I, I have those on a, a replacement cycle. We bought, let's say we bought five devices, and we buy them with five years of maintenance. So, I did that so we can start replacing one every year, and they get replaced. Everyone gets replaced every five years. It's under maintenance until it gets replaced. And you know that that's, that alone is like 120 grand. So that's trying to get it back on the uh, replacement side. So what we what we discussed is, and partly to help us ease into this a little bit, is that he, each data center has five of them. So that's ten. So that's a $720,000 purchase. So what we thought, and we're going to be evaluating before we get to August, but in August we'll have the decision or recommendation, is that maybe we lease that part. But my concern is with technology changing so fast, if he buys two a year, and by year three or year four, you may have connectivity issues. So you buy all the same technology, and in five years you, you do a new lease, and, and we're just worried about the lease payment. So that helps us kind of ease into that nirvana level, and so um, our juror fund will um, will be able to cover that. And you know, for years we've had we've had kind of an allocation for to replace laptops and computers and all that. But I think you know what gets often gets forgotten about is all the back office stuff, the switches, the um, you know the, uh, the the data center and those kind of things. And that's what we want to start addressing. If we if we own it. We need to maintain it, and we need to be prepared to replace it in the future. That's what that's what we're talking about. So, pretty excited about that. Oh, any other questions for uh, for our journey? We good? Okay. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. Okay. All right. We're going to do uh, the city manager's office now, and then uh, I'm going to tag team that a little bit with um, Angie. Our here, and then, then we'll be right. Okay. Okay. So that'll be close to about 10. Is this the last of the board? CMO and city secretary's office. Okay. And we are still ahead of schedule, like we suspected, so we're going to find some few things. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about the city manager's office, and right after me, we'll be borrowed to the city secretary's office, then we'll take a break, and then by that time, we'll, we're going to advance some of the other topics. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's do a quick five minute. How's that? Oh, oh, let's go. Let's go. Five minutes. Yeah. All right, guys, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we have a few more departments to do, and then at that point, we'll wrap up the departments and kind of go into a little bit more uh, some of the strategy stuff. So, um, city manager's office obviously includes myself, uh, the deputy city manager, uh, Ben Whitehead, but we also have some interesting things wrapped into ours. For years, we had the neighborhood life, which we now have under uh, community development. But before that, uh, you know, we've had public information uh, in our office, which is again Denise uh, Parrot and Drew uh, Chris. So that gives us the the, the print media. Um, the news letters we do, things like that, and then on the uh, RTN 16, which is withdrew. So those are under us. And then also the grant position that we created a few years ago. And you'll remember, we started off by budgeting for a half-time person. We had, um, we had uh, somebody that was in the Army Reserves that, that did that. She got deployed, she came back, stayed for a very short period of time. So, so really over about a two year period, we really did not run the program like we would have liked to have. Um, so now uh, we have a full time person. Uh, and so it's, there's a few tweaks that we're gonna add to that. 
um, in terms of cost, and you'll, you'll see that here in just a little bit. Um, so let's go ahead and, and go to uh, the uh, next section, uh, next page. Oh, I have it. I'm sorry, where's my, oh, thank you. I have to do this left-handed, I'm, I'm not, okay, good. So, um, I did want to say this because, as you know, PPP has been a pretty serious initiative for us. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, a year ago, this was, or two years ago, this was the kind of stuff that we were getting from staff. It's kind of like, you want us to do what? And, uh, and so that, it, it took a while to kind of get into the boat. Um, we have some departments that are really embracing this and really spending time with it. Um, and we're, we're working through that to be able to have something that we can be proud of and something that we can really uh, utilize. So in terms of our, our budget request this year, uh, one is uh, volunteer software. So, um, you know, our staff puts a lot of time right now into um, screening volunteers and getting them on record. Um, we've had a very uh, active volunteer program for years. Um, there's been times where, you know, we've had as high as 10 to the equivalency of about 10 to 15 uh, full-time employees. Uh, so, of course, last year with COVID, that, that would not have been possible, but um, one of the requests we have is to be able to get software to help us with this. And, you know, you can look at 19. So, obviously, 2020 is an anomaly, but in 2019, uh, the equivalent was about 9.7, and I think the year before that was just over 10. So, um, you know, if it wasn't for this kind of program, we, we, we have people in council, I know you're aware, we do the annual awards program, and we recognize some of those folks. And for years, we've had some full-time volunteers. And so this is a very important program for us. One thing that our, uh, uh, that Denise Parrott, who runs as part of the program, is asking for is the software. So it's, it's, a, it's a volunteer management tool. We're able to enter them into the database. Uh, it's a small subscription fee. Uh, and I'll just say this, uh, you're hearing everything staff is asking for. You know, some things are gonna make it to the budget, whether you know, you're know you aware of it or not, other things are big enough ticket items, we really need some help you know, in terms of, of weighing. But you're, you're getting to see everything. So uh, it'd be unlimited administrators, which is really good. Um, it'll help with reporting, and we can track up to 500 active volunteers. You can see uh, 2019, I think that was the highest we've had, was 284. We don't envision this being an issue, and if it is, then we'll, we'll upgrade it at that time. Um, so that was our, our first request. Uh, I'll, unless you stop me, I'll keep going to see some of the others. We only just have a few. The other is our digital media specialist. So this is another area where we've been hearing for years from council um, a desire to spend more time on social media. Um, and quite frankly, our staff needs help with this too so that we can, we can do that. One thing that this position would help us do is uh, improve our uh, engagement with our residents um, and you know, spend more time helping to build content. So, you know, Denise, parents, and Drew, they do a fantastic job, but they are two people. One focuses on the, um, the, the print media, including um, social media. The other one is uh, primarily um, um, digital media, which includes RTN 16. And uh, I think there's so much more that we can do if they have some help, particularly in the area of writing content and to help manage some of the social media. So let so, me add let me ask something about that, Brian. Um, I know that all the departments or several of the departments have their own Facebook page. Would it be consolidated to this person? Not necessarily, repeat, but I... Repeat the question. I'm sorry, okay. So the question is, um, we have multiple departments that actually have their own Facebook page. Um, and we also have departments that produce their own print material, such as like the RCC, their cataloging and, and calendar, the library does the same thing. So the question is, would this position um, centralize or eliminate the need for somebody to manage all those other sites? It does not. Um, instead, what I believe will happen, it needs to enhance what we're doing now and, and address areas we're not really getting into. So to help with social media management, you know, police, fire, those that run their own programs, 
I think what you will have is a higher degree of coordination and collaboration, yes, but I don't think that you're, we're talking about eliminating those because in some cases they are the, the entry level source for that material, particularly for stuff that needs to get out very quickly. Didn't mean to snap my fingers at you, so. Oh, uh, that's fine, but it caught my attention. <laughs> Who has the other comment? Oh, I guess I can just turn it up. Okay. Um, so we've talked a lot about marketing the city over the years, and would this be able to have a primary focus on marketing the city, or, or just responding to citizens, which, you know, we gotta be more strategic than that. We, we are approaching this as more proactive manner. Um, that does not necessitate the fact that there does not need to be a reactive part of this too, which is addressing questions and things like that we see on media. We see this more as proactive. So in other words, getting ahead of the curve, building education campaigns, uh, marketing campaigns, and those kind of things, that's how we view it. Thanks. Um, so, obviously this, this helps meet uh, one of our key goals, which is to actively educate and engage and communicate with the community through a variety of channels. And, and as you know, there are channels we're still not really into. Um, we had an employee with a next door account, that got us into the next door area arena, but they're still, we're not into Snapchat, we're not into, um, you know, uh, not every single digital platform, but from time to time, you know, some of these are starting to grow where we may need to have a presence into. So we're not quite always into all of those, but I think what we are into, particularly so uh, Facebook and Twitter and some of those, we are spending a lot of time with, but I think the gap is what we're talking about is that we're not spending enough time proactively marketing the city and, um, and, and communicating with our residents in that regard. And I hate to say it this way, but, I'll, but, but we'll be blind a little bit. It's more hidden than this. So when we have a bond election come out there, there's, you know, everybody gears up for this level of activity. But then when something comes up in the moment that we don't normally deal with or don't, uh, this is something we haven't really addressed in the past, then we're all sitting around trying to figure out what are we going to do, how are we going to do it, when we really need somebody out there managing that part of it. And somebody who then develops institutional memory for, you know, these are the kinds of campaigns we're going to run under these kind of circumstances. And that's how you really get ahead of these things. So in terms of position summary, we promote city activities. So uh, that, that's one that would help with that. Programs and services. Um, create and manage content for social media posts and campaigns. So this person would take a lead at times. Um, so in other words, Denise and Drew still do what they do best, but it also would provide help for them uh, in terms of like, you know, Drew, the specific discussion we had with Drew is, you know, he writes a lot of his own content, like for our show and things like that. This person could help with that. Um, that would free him up to do what he does best and not to have to take some of the shortcuts, um, you know, that he might take from time to time when he has to digitize um, you know, um, some of that content. Uh, website publishing, writing, graphics generation. So this will be really critical is the writing part, which is the content. So Drew will handle, for example, the digital, uh, the digital uh, part of this, but it's the content that this person can assist with. And then supporting and implementing uh, digital communication uh, for citizen engagement and traffic and digital media management. Uh, or digital media channels, excuse me. So that's kind of a summary of what we see this position being able to do. Um, working alongside our community relations manager and creative services producer, um, sharing content across all communication platforms. We actually, this is kind of interesting, we have some software that helps us do that so that when, when Denise, uh, for example, publishes on the website, it automatically goes to Facebook automatically goes to Twitter, but there are a lot of programs out there that cannot do it automatically. You know, everybody, the proprietary information, so if you want to engage in that platform, you have to go and then do that individually, and some aren't even as easy as cut and paste. Um, assisting in development of the overall uh, social media strategy would also be uh, one, and you know, and we have some intel on this, like the audience preferences, 
that's, you know, Denise is able to run a report that tells us when are people actually logging into Facebook. So we know that. And so she knows that between 6.30 and 8 o'clock every night is when most people, you know, the, the kids are fed and, and bathed and in bed, and mom or dad's going to sit down now, and they're going to go and start scrolling through so their uh, Facebook page or whatever. That's, that's a, a, a prime target for us to release um, a, a post. And so she knows that. She can prepare it during the day, but she knows that it won't go out until, say, 7 o'clock or whatever the, the time frame she's trying to get. So this costs about uh, the salary range about forty six seventy thousand um, dollars. That does not include benefits. That is pure, are purely the, the the salary. And so this is this is a request that we're making this year. Um, that that is um, that we're going to be considering um, for how we prioritize. Uh, I think any questions on that one? Okay. Um, Oh, uh, so grant coordinator. One thing uh, I also want to say about our grant coordinator, having a full-time grant coordinator has just, particularly in this environment, has just absolutely rocked our world. Uh, particularly one as experienced as the individual we hired out of New Orleans. Um, the expertise they have with federal level grants and the technical knowledge they have about grants, period. Not just merely the, how do I sell this, you know, in terms of the narrative I'm writing, but also understanding the nuances about what what we need to put in those um, requests to be able to get it. And in some cases, being able to have a realistic conversation with staff to say, you know, we, we're not going to spend that level of time to go after that grant, which is so competitive, and we don't have the right story to tell. So basically the ability to say, that's not the right grant to go after. Even though it's a full-time person, you still can't go after every grant in the world. It's just impossible. But what we are doing is has been pretty, pretty spectacular. So what we what we're really doing here today, um, and, and again, this goes back to we're, everybody's just telling you guys what we're working on. So uh, is that when our when our budget was first done, you'll remember a few years ago, it was based on a part-time person. So now we kind of know what this, uh, uh, now that we have a full-time person, we know what our real costs are going to be. So we're going to tweak the operating budget to make sure we have the training, the registration, uh, those kind of things that are in there, travel, um, dues, um, some of those costs there too. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it's several thousand dollars as you can see to make sure. Because again, that was an area we did not spend a lot of time on made that position full-time and we know what we need to do there but um, going back to this so you know the establishment of our grant office promotes you know not only operational excellence it touches every department in the city um, police are finding more and more ways to use them we've always had a really good um, you know uh, grant uh, you know um, uh, application effort and fire but we have a lot of departments that need help. We, we have not spent that kind of time with them. So uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Angie. She's going to talk to you about some of the other grants that, um, that they're applying for. Um, we do realize that there will be grants that we won't get, even once we put in that kind of effort. But if you don't ask, we won't get it all. So. So I probably don't need a microphone because I'm loud, but I will use it and I will talk a little softer than I normally do. Um, the great thing about Ron is Ron has experience in grants. So he worked for the city of New Orleans, he worked for the Port of New Orleans, he's also a Texas licensed attorney. So he knows where to find those grant opportunities and he knows a lot of the information that's back information that he can help the department get the right information for the right grant. Um, so these are just a few um, of some of them that he has recently applied for. Um, the Bloomberg, I'm not even trying to say that word. Yep, that word that Brian just said. Um, so what, what Ron is focusing his attention on is finding grants that fit within our strategic priorities. So when he does a slideshow for us, and you'll start seeing these updates, 
Um, it talks about what strategic priority does it fall into, and then this is the asphalt art grant that we applied for last year. Um, what Rod's learned is most cities apply a couple of times before they're awarded, and that is pretty much the case for a lot of grants. So they have reapplied for this one, working very closely with the Arts and Humanities Commission. Another one is a solid race grant, so this is the Rev grant that you saw. Um, he has now applied for the next round of solid waste grants to partner with our police department um, on cleaning up encampments along the tank line. So the police department is able to identify those. Um, the community services division is able to go out and help the folks find somewhere else to be besides our camp, besides our lakefront. And then the new grant will fund a trailer and an ATV to be able to go out and get to those locations and get those things cleaned up. This particular grant um, was, we're just now wrapping up the final pieces of it. You saw the van picture yesterday, and so we're partnering with KRB to, to really up our recycling um, and encouraging people to recycle. Texas Reads is another grant that he has just applied for. Um, and is in the process of going through. You can see here some of the deadlines he manages. And imagine that he manages these deadlines for every single grant. And so every grant is very labor intensive, not only for him, but also for our finance department. So Ken Townsend in finance helps him with the financial sides of the grants and making sure that it's getting accounted. Some of our grants are reimbursement grants. So the REV grant, for example, is a reimbursement grant. So not only do we have to meet our own purchasing procedures, we also have to meet COG's purchasing procedures, and they're not always 100% the same. Um, and then we pay for it, and then we get reimbursed. Yes, Mayor. So these don't have dollar amounts on them, so I don't have any idea if these are like million dollar grants, $30,000 grants. Um, so as you do this in the future, if you can help with that, and then as you get this presentation, if you could help with that. Oh, well, for sure. Uh, the REV grant, was about $50,000. The Texas Reads is a smaller grant. I think it's only about $25,000 at memory serves me right. Like I said, we are in the process of burning up exactly what a grant snapshot report looks like so that you're not getting more information that you need, but you can see kind of what we're working on. Uh, the Green Muscle Grant is a grant geared at, um, he partnered with Friends of Rowlett and it's geared at providing money for medical requests for dogs. Um, I do not know what the total amount of this grant application was, but he worked very closely with our friends group to gather all the information they need, and then it will provide um, medical expense help to the animal shelter. The first responder mental health, so this is one that we're getting ready to apply for. We just, if you remember, replied for, applied for and received one first responder, which gives um, JJ and uh, Chad Colwell over at the Crisis Intervention Program a mental health coordinator. So it will provide a mental health coordinator salary for, I believe, two years. Um, and it is also renewable. So they'll have a resource right there with a social work background, it's not a PD background, it's a social work background, to help them then find services for these folks that they're helping PD handle. This is a second one. This is the one that just came to city council. Um, we had to pre-approve a resolution in order to um, apply for that one. I think that's it. That's kind of just a snapshot, like I said. In the next 30 days, you should start getting a monthly snapshot. Ryan and I have kind of been working through what that may look like. Um, Ron will be here after a while. He's also taken on all of our ARPA and in association with finance to make sure that we're really applying. He's, he's treating it as a, kind of like a city grant, right? So departments are working with him on what fits the criteria and working with Brian on how we roll it out. Any great questions or Brian questions? I um, would like to talk again about the possibility of developing an app for the city. I know that our website is mobile friendly, but really the wave of the future is to have apps for communication. 
Um, I don't think y'all have looked into that yet. I, I brought this up a couple years in a row. Um, I don't think it's probably an expensive um, purchase, but it's probably a maintenance thing. <laughs> so, but I think it's important for us to look at that. We have a city app. It is not very interactive. I would classify it as not really positive. Yeah. So let me rephrase that. I would like us to look at revising and uh, increasing our, our app. Um, my other did anybody else have a comment on that? Um, my other comment is um, in this whole budget process, we need. I think we need to have and and potential May bond elections. I think we need to lay out a town hall meeting schedule. So I don't know what you have in your mind for a budget town hall, but I think we need to probably figure that out and get that on the calendar right now. Um, because a lot of people are traveling and moving around. And... Okay, we'll make that happen. Um, I mean, if we think we need a budget town hall. We did one two years ago, didn't we? Not we didn't do a lot of a COVID, but I thought we did one two years yes, ago. Yeah, and you know, who knows? I, I think it would be good to touch base with the public on here's the budgeting and here's the decisions we made and here's what's coming down uh, soon to, you know, um, in regards to May stuff. So it's kind of like dual purpose. Here's what the budget looks like and here's up and coming stuff that you're going to be considering. Yeah, I think it's smart. We did it two years ago because of SB2, and then it was COVID year. Now we have to, but I thought it was informative for sure. It'll be good. Anybody else? Yeah, I just had a question about mental health coordinator, has that person been hired yet? I think they are in the process of hiring that person. I know they have posted a job, but I haven't gotten an update. Okay, something. so they're moving for that position. Uh, I'm excited to have that person. Uh, and, uh, and then also, uh, I know that, that uh, Ron is working on so many more things than just the stuff that we landed there. I know he's working on some EPA. Uh, stuff for our water quality and so there's just there's tons of great stuff that's out there uh, and to your point you know we can't do them all uh, some of them just are too burdensome administratively to try and do but uh, but I just think he's doing an excellent job so excited that we have a full-time qualified uh, person out doing the grant applications so good job Rod's the guy that you say, hey, we should do, and he's like, oh, okay, great, let's fill that out. So, great resource. Yeah. Did you have any other questions for city manager's office before I go ahead? Okay. For the record, Laura Hallmark, city secretary. <laughs> you have the same comment. <laughs> for City Council, City Secretary, and Action Center. All three budgets are remaining flat for the upcoming year. We're not making any requests. But I do want to touch on some items. And these three are just a drop in the bucket compared to the other departments. Again, the City Council budget remains flat pending any City Council discussion. But I do want to touch on the association dues. The request does remain the same for the upcoming year, but some dues were decreased due to COVID-19 and a concern of the organizations for the city's abilities to participate. And so those dues were lowered in some cases. And so looking forward towards things becoming more normal, those costs may increase. So once we go through this next cycle, we'll have a better upcoming year. Can you hand me the microphone, guys? 
it on. And then Chiefs to tell you, uh, Laura, the DRMC Dallas Regional Mobility Coalition dues will be 75% of that 4448. Uh, last year they were 50%. This next year they'll be 75%. And I, tell me if this is not the right time to talk about this, but you know, we took off um, uh, legal, National Legal Cities. Um, is this the right time to talk about that? Sure. Okay, so I just want to touch base with, with Council again on this. Um, you know, how do you feel about the decision we made? Did we change it? Does, you know, there was a lot of involvement by National League of Cities during the COVID year and during the legislative session. I would just like to hear from you all of, of you know, whether we keep it as is or if we get back in. Here. Uh, there are other things that we need to take another look at it. Um, you know, one of the reasons that, um, that we got out of the NLC, um, probably the biggest reason was the cost. Uh, it was over $10,000 a year, uh, much higher than anything else that, that we're members of. And, uh, and so we were in a very tight budget year. I think this was a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, we just had to make some hard decisions. Um, however, I think I did see an email um, in the last week or so that, um, that made me think that they may have reduced uh, their membership fee. And so, I, you know, they were very active during COVID, did a lot of good, and, uh, and so I think it's worth at least having another look at. I'm, I'm okay with that. I, you know, um, Martha and I got involved in a more a granular detail that year before we made that decision to make sure we were informed and and able to make the right decision, then we really have been removed from NLC since then. Um, if we as a council decide we want to, to jump back in, I really think it's important that we have a council person that keeps that as their focus. You know, we have a couple, one or two council people here today that pay a lot of attention to what's going on at TML. Um, I'm an officer on our, our Region 13 TML uh, board. Um, so what I don't want to happen is, you know, we decide to pay dues for NLC and we get a few emails, but nobody's really paying attention to it. That, that would be the opinion. So I'm looking at their FY 2021 <coughs> membership dues, and for our population, it will be 5,600. So it's a lot less than Yeah, uh, and let me, let me correct that more and help me with that. It was text 21. That was the ten thousand dollars that we dropped, and, and I think that was a good decision. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not asking to bring tax twenty one. You bet. <laughs> uh, but um, but I, I do think that, that we should have another look at um, uh, this. And well, this is the time to make that decision. So have another look at. I'm not sure what else we would look at. I, I think we can make that decision today, and should make that decision today. Do we want to get back into National League of Cities? And if we do, who's going to own it, if you will, uh, just like we do other organizations? Exactly. And that's, that's the way to get it. Thoughts, Council? Um, I mean, during, during the pandemic, I still receive emails from them that just ends up in my email. I, I do think that there is valuable information I mean, I'm getting all that information and I'm having to pay for that. So, um, I don't know. I mean, I think that you want that decision made today, right now. You know, if you are a member, you can participate in other events. It's not just communication coming at you. So, in my mind, if we want to spend that money and become a member, we need to be active in that organization to some extent. If we're not going to be active and we're just going to receive emails, there's no reason to change what we're doing. Um, so if anyone on this council would like to own an LC, I hate that word, but, but you know, and make sure we're active in that, I think we can make a decision to re-up. If not, I think we leave it as is. But 
State your opinion as the microphone goes by you. Okay, here's, here's my opinion on that because uh, the mayor and I did attend their conference and, uh, and I can tell you, I, I think that TML offers a lot more bang for the buck that is applicable to what we do as a city. And uh, it's just like the grants, you can't do everything. And so, uh, you know, if we're getting some good information uh, from the emails, um, I, I don't know what we would do uh, as far as being more active other than, you know, going to the, uh, going to the conference. I know that uh, you can network with a lot of people from around the nation, but as far as the, uh, being an organization where we can have an effect, uh, I, I don't really see that as a benefit. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm much more supportive of uh, TML in that aspect. So I'm looking, I'm looking on the website now. Um, they only have two uh, annual conference meetings, and that's the City Summit, which is anywhere in the country this year in Salt Lake City, it's and then Congressional City Summit, which is even in D.C. for that. Um, other than that, there's committees. I'm kind of of the same opinion that we get so much value out of TML, um, and, and they do, they, they have such a more direct impact on us um, than this. I think $5,600 can go somewhere else. I agree with that as long as um, the mayor stays active in the U.S. Conference of Mayors, because you know, T uh, National League of Cities is is a federal level, not just state level. Um, and you know, when I term out in May, I would highly encourage the next mayor to stay active in the U.S. Conference of Mayors, and I would highly encourage this council to continue funding them, because I do think that has a lot of influence um, across the nation in regards to policies that affect individual cities. So it has much more influence than an LC. Um, so anyway. And I, I, that's a, I mean, if we're not gonna have somebody that's super involved with it or we're not getting the value out of it, then, then I would recommend being it. I think that's why we dropped it in the first place. And thank you for the discussion. Brownie agrees. Pam agrees. Wait, I think we're all agree. Okay, so that's all I have for the council. The City Secretary's Office and Action Center touched all of the city's priorities in the strategic plan, whether it be through the agenda publication process, calls to the Action Center, open records requests, or through the records management program. Again, this City Secretary budget stays flat. The only additions are the contractual computer software maintenance increases and the increased cost for uh, elections. I just wanted to cover a couple of the PDB items that there are more, but I'm just going to highlight a couple of these. These are the legislative actions, which are the ordinances and resolutions passed by council. Public information requests. These are external, does not include internal, whether it be other departments or um, other cities contacting us informally. And so far this year, we've had 983 open records requests. Yesterday, I think we all mentioned one stop shop kind of cover use, but that's really what the Action Center is. It's the front line for the city, it's the first contact some people ever make with the city. And we'd like to continue to market the Action Center as the one contact we need to remember or know to access all things city related and to get away from the Citizen Action Center moniker because our customers encompass more than just our citizens. So email actioncenter at rollet.com or call the Action Center, which is the 412-6100 number. Again, this budget remains flat, and the only increase is the contractual obligation for computer software. One of the PDB items that we monitor is call volume. This fluctuates due to hot topic issues. There was a decrease 
and last year reflecting the winter storm week when calls were forwarded to an actual cell phone because of an ability to use the system the way we thought it would be used. But I believe you know from IT that there are steps that they've taken to enable us to utilize the phone system remotely and not, be, not have to miss out on those important calls. One of the other items is the call handling time. Again, fluctuations due to hot topic issues. Average call time varies based on the customer issues, coordination with other departments uh, regarding processes or context helps facilitate response and conclusion of calls. But when transferring calls, we try to transfer to a message as a last resort. We always try to get them a live person. And <clears throat> time handling calls can be extended due to attempts to reach a live person. And oftentimes, people will call and will answer the phone at the action center, and they're surprised that they get a live person, and they're very excited that they didn't just go to a phone tree, which I understand is rare when you contact a municipality. And another thing is we have a lot of our contact information on the website. There are some cities that don't have any contact information on the website, and you can't figure out how to reach anybody. Yeah. Hey, Laura. Mm -hmm. uh, do you guys... Uh, do you guys uh, track the subject matter of the calls? That that would be an interesting uh, statistic to have. Like, I, when I look at these increased calls, I wonder how much of it is related to bulk trash pickup. Um, you know, it, it would just be nice to know. Um, and, and I don't know how burdensome that might be for, um, for your team, but, um, but it would be good to know what the hot topics are. Uh, for council so that, so that we can kind of get a little glimpse of, of what's coming in uh, as far as requests go. Correct. So in answer to your question, we don't currently track the topic of each phone call. We do track the customer service requests such as water leaks, potholes, street repairs, alley repairs, things of that nature. We email um, FCC regarding trash calls. So we can access that information, but we can certainly look into finding a way to, you know, take mark next to a subject or something like that. Right. Yeah. We can look into that. Be good to have that feedback. So for the past year, the City Secretary's Office and Action Center, I'm proud to say that we've been able to provide all of our operations and services throughout the COVID-19 without interruptions. So anybody trying to access our services didn't see any change during that time. And a lot of that is in part to IT's facilitating our ability to have staff work from home and um, offer those um, services. And also, along with Joey and Drew, facilitated virtual meetings for council and planning and zoning throughout that time, time frame. So before I get to the questions, for staffing issues, I don't anticipate a need for an increase in staff until we transition to a new municipal complex. As part of the facilities assessment discussion, we discussed uh, with the city manager's office a possible reception area that would be an offshoot of the action center and then we would need additional staff for that. But as of now, we have no requests. So are there any questions? I just want to say that this is the first year in the budget that I have, I am not saying we need more administrative support, and that's because of um, the, the increased coordination between um, you and me and the level of service has been very, very high, and I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. All right, so Mayor, uh, Council, at this time, we're going to take a 15 minute break. We are ahead of schedule, as we mentioned earlier. So when we come back, 
Uh, you're going to go ahead and do the ARPA um, uh, discussion. Then we're going to take our lunch break and we'll do the legislative update. And then we're going to go ahead and do our wrap up and our PPP discussion. And then we may be getting out of here a little early today. So uh, let's go ahead, 15 minute break. I need to ask you a question. Sorry. I, I'll, I'll do it offline. Okay, guys, we're on. So let's go ahead and get started with our uh, next topic. Now, as we mentioned earlier, we are going ahead of schedule. So today we have our grants coordinator, Ron Harper, with us. And uh, as I as we were bragging on Ron earlier, there's a, um, he brings a huge amount of strengths to our team in terms of um, experience and expertise, the ability to, to read down to the fine detail and, and realize maybe what we probably shouldn't be asking for and maybe where we can. So, now coordination, he's doing with staff, we're extremely happy to have him on board with us. So, this next topic is to talk about how we would uh, allocate the $6.8 million we're getting under the uh, American Rescue Plan Act. And, uh, you know, just to say that every city and uh, county and state across the country um, or getting an allocation from that act. Now, the act is much bigger than that. Uh, let's see it. Oh, here it is. So, let's just talk a little bit about what the act is. American Rescue Plan Act um, was a uh, is an economic stimulus plan um, by the federal government, um, and there are major components to it. So, there's individual assistance that. Uh, that the Treasury has sent directly to individuals, there's business assistance, there's multiple programs and sub-programs within the total, and the city of Rowlett, along with other local government, are a beneficiary as well. So, there still are some restrictions on how money can be spent. So, for example, uh, early on, we were very confused, extremely confused, with how the allocation methodology was coming out. You know, how would a city the size of Rowlett with over 70,000 population get 6.8 million and run right across the lake in Rockwall, you know, they would get over $10 million and they have like 46, 47,000 people and Saxe, which is even smaller, getting almost as much as Rowlett. So there was a lot of confusion about that initially. In addition, there was some confusion about why, why would the, uh, the, uh, the federal government allow us to spend money on water and sewer, but not on roads and bridges and alleys, you know, and things like that, other infrastructure. So since that time, there has been some, some clarification on why that is. One thing that we understand from President Biden is that he was hoping that uh, roads and bridges would come out of the infrastructure programs that they're trying to get through the federal government right now. And that was one of the reasons why they did not include that in this. Um, but regardless of the whys and, and wherefores, uh, we're getting $6.8 million in over two years. We've already got the first half sitting in the bank. So, uh, and then next year we would get the other $3.4 million. So overall, uh, $61.5 billion was set aside for local governments. Um, 45 billion of that going to cities with 50,000 plus community members for the sake of the public that may be watching. Uh, that was the magic uh, population number that the federal government uh, established. So basically over 50,000, there was a modified formula that they used uh, from the community development block grant methodology. Uh, so that was, use this let me show you how to use it. Test, 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 test. Okay, we'll try this one then. All right, so um, so overall, if you're over 50,000 population, there was a modified CBG formula that they used, um, and that takes into account a lot of issues uh, such as uh, uh, average housing uh, value and um, other criteria. But if you're under 50,000 population, it was just based on a pure per capita amount. And that's one of the reasons why it has created this, this level of disparity um, across the country. But regardless, 
Um, the money can be spent to provide services that were cut due to revenue losses. Uh, that was really instrumental uh, during the pandemic. Making necessary investments in water, sewer, broadband infrastructure, responding to the cost of COVID-19 and its impacts, and then providing premium pay even to essential workers or grants to businesses that employ essential workers. Why are you looking at me like that? Well, you were pointing outside. I'm pointing outside. I'm doing this. So when you saw it. <coughs> bird, it's a bird. Bird, it's a bird. Bird, it's a bird. Testing. Okay. So the way that's worded, and you'll probably get into it earlier uh, in more detail, it says, uh, uh, providing services that were cut due to revenue losses caused by the pandemic, making necessary investments in water, sewer, and broadband. Are those two separate concepts? Uh, or? Yes, they're two separate concepts. Okay, because that's not how it's worded there. Yeah. Okay. Two separate concepts. Good. All right. All right, so um, Raleigh is getting $6.2 million. We've already received the first 3.4 tranche. Um, we will get another one uh, approximately about a year. Um, and it does cover cost through 2024, calendar year 2024. So basically it's about three years that this program's in effect. Now, even though it says, and this is true, technically the cost must have been incurred beginning on March 3rd, 2021, the first year's revenue loss, the calculated loss, is our last fiscal year. So uh, in terms of the revenue losses, you can do revenue losses for up to three years. So, and it's based on a calculated formula. And essentially what they try to do with the formula is to say that if we had not had the pandemic, you should be on a three-year trend in terms of your income. So if you were growing 5% per year and the pandemic had not happened, then the presumption is that fiscal year 2020 we should have been 5% higher than the, the three-year trend. And, uh, and the next year, we should be 5% higher than that, and the next year, 5% higher than that. We have done some of the analysis. There was actually a, uh, a software uh, program that the GFOA, the Government Finance Officers Association, has put out. We're evaluating that. It does not look like Rel Lab would be able to tap into that area very much. There is some maybe, but but we're still looking into that to see how. Uh, because once you apply that, let's say let's say that for us it was a million dollars, then Rel can spend that million dollars on anything. So you're not restricted then to the things that they say you can or can't spend that money on. Now in principle we may want to use it that way. But, but that was a restriction that uh, is lifted once we apply that against revenue losses. For the most part, we won't be able to get enough out of that to be able to do much with. Um, the other thing is water, sewer, broadband infrastructure. I will say, although it's not on this, storm drainage is also included uh, with storm water. Um, so that's a, a, a possible utility there. We can respond to COVID-19 emergency uh, cost and that's across the board, much like our CARES money, which we have a slide on too. Uh, we can spend it to help with our businesses. We can spend it to help on it with individuals. So there's other things that we can do with that money. Revenue replacement for the provision of government services, premium pay for essential workers. Um, there's a lot in there about essential workers. So there's a huge recognition in this act um, to make sure that we're doing things that helps essential workers and not just, you know, not necessarily just every worker. So there are some key things that are ineligible. So one of those is uh, revenue resulting from a tax cut. So early on, when this first came out, there were some, some cities that said, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna reduce our tax rate and, and wanna use this money to offset it, and you can't do that. Um, so that's one thing that you, you can't uh, get away with. The other thing, you cannot fix your pension fund. If you have a pension fund that's broken, you can. We have a very strong, uh, we're one of the strongest retirement systems in the country. We have very high funding rate. So, uh, so that's not an issue we would have. But you may have read articles about some cities, you know, Houston and Fort Worth, that have really been struggling with funding their pension systems. So there were cities initially early on that wanted to tap into that 
that to help fix that, but you can't, you can't use it for that. Um, you can't use it for roads and bridges. So uh, that's an area that was carved out specifically or not included, I should say, so it's excluded. Um, so there were some things that you cannot do with the money. And, you know, just like with the CARES Act, there's still a lot of unknowns. Uh, Ron was telling me uh, earlier this week that there is at least an FAQ that they have finally released, um, which is helpful. But you'll remember with the CDBG CD funds, it was three months or longer before we really felt like we had strong enough guidance to really spend the dollars that, that we were getting through that source of revenue. And that's the one where there's a lot more, usually a lot more tricks uh, to it that we have to be very cautious about so we don't spend money that we have to get back to the federal government at some point. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna go over uh, some of the requests and I'll, I'll just so you kind of know how we've done this. Um, Ron is approaching this, uh, these funds as, as if he is managing uh, an endowment or a grant. So essentially departments are making requests, he's going through to check eligibility. And, um, and so we, we've kind of, it's almost like our, our departments have been asking for uh, grand dollars uh, through, uh, as if they we're going through an external organization a little bit. It's really gonna help us with future management of it. But this is where we're at right now. You're gonna see three pages, which you have in front of you. One is all the water and sewer requests. Then we have a page for some of the broadband stuff, and then we have a page for just some miscellaneous items as well. Um, I know this is a little hard to see, but this is why it's in front of you. It was uh, because there's so many requests, it has a small spot size. But uh, so just to go through some of these, uh, in total about $24 million. Now, what is the benefit of the city with these programs? Well, some of these we would put off for a longer period of time. For example, we don't have a funding strategy at this point to replace, uh, to put in generators to all sewer lift stations. That's $1.8 million. So what we have instead, we were trying to pick away at it like maybe one lift station a year. And you know that takes 13 years to get them all done. So that's not a, a good solution. Uh, we have our waterline uh, looping project. So there are still some areas in town where we have dead end water lines. And every once in a while we gotta go out and blow those out and clean that water out for, for people if you're on the end of the line. Uh, not to mention sometimes your pressure can drop off uh, when we have an issue that we have to solve for. Um, we have our groundwater storage tank. So, so there are there are opportunities that we have with these funds, the Dalrock Blue Station in Bannerman. You may remember that when we uh, built the Bayside Sewer Lift Station, we were gonna, once it was fully operational, we were gonna be able to abandon three other sewer lift stations. Rowlett has 25 or 26 sewer lift stations in town because of our topography. And so each one of those is expensive to build and to maintain and to operate. And so this would, uh, you know, we have some that are on the list that we are going to have to pay costs to abandon in the future. And, but yet in doing that, we're making a more efficient system. So there's, that's an opportunity for us. Um, Dixon sewer line upgrade. So that's another uh, project. That, uh, that gives us the ability to do something that otherwise is gonna have to show up in that three, in that $7 million a year in bonds that we're, that we're issuing. Um, some of the other stuff would not, would have to be funded by our pay-as-you-go cash. And so that's another area where, uh, so there is a real opportunity for us to do some things to shore up some areas that we probably have some vulnerabilities which is why our number one priority up here is the generators for the sewer stations. That's an area where every storm, and you know, yes, you may have, you know, the ice storm a few years ago might have been a uh, once in a 50 year event. Um, the severe winter storm this year might have been a once in a 100 year event. But every year, there are two or three events, whether it's just high winds or a major storm that comes through or something that causes power to go out and then we're sitting around, dancing around, 
Our, our team is out there running down to all the lift stations that are without power, and they are pumping them down, and they go going to the next one and pumping them down and trying to avoid a spillover. We need generators for those lift stations. And, you know, and we may be able to do some other things with the rest of the money, but I will tell you it is the number one priority, and I believe it's where we have the most vulnerability. We also have about a million dollars in broadband opportunities. So, um, so staff, uh, Joey, has identified uh, potential programs. Now, initially, when we had our first blush at this, before we started digging into the details, you know, we knew that there was an opportunity. We, we've got to build fiber down to Sapphire Bay. And so, you know, that was $80,000 to $100,000. So that's obviously on the list, but we knew that we were going to have to do that at some point. But as we started getting into it and realizing other things that could be included uh, in the broadband, you can see there are some other projects up here. Uh, we can do some more on our firewalls. Um, there's also some um, uh, some of the discovery reconfiguration, and uh, I cannot remember based on what Joey was talking about earlier. One of the things on his list is that in the 350 Angie, do we know or somebody? He asked for I think what was it, thirty or forty or thousand dollars? Okay, so so thank you, Robert. Um, so uh, next time I'll start with the budget officer. So yes. Um, so, you'll remember when we had that discussion with Joey earlier, one of the things that he identified as a, as a, uh, as a critical uh, request this year was about forty dollars or $50,000 to do the as builds for our entire fiber optic system. Uh, we know about where some of those lines are, but at times we don't always know how deep they are. And just to say, uh, they're, uh, they were building PGBT. Uh, we had uh, gone into the, a program with the GISD to, uh, to build the conduit for so much of our, we were just starting really our fiber optic line. And, uh, and although, although it was marked, there was still a question and just enough of a lack of knowledge that, that the, um, the contractor for Textile or NTPA um, caught that fiber wire on down Main Street while they were building PGBT with an auger and ripped, ripped out the uh, conduit for our rec center, for the high school, uh, affecting City Hall, and um, and there was a cost associated with that, but, um, but there was some argument in there that there were places where we were supposed to have that fiber optic line or conduit built at a certain depth, and there were clearly some areas that it weren't. And then the question was, was it not only, not it was too shallow, but instead of being here, it was over here. And so they ended up doing their augering and ended up catching it. So it's a real thing, and so he does need to do that. So there's an opportunity there. Uh, obviously, we talked about the fiber to Sapphire Bay. Um, and then um, some of the switches that we feel like we can do. All of these things are investments in broadband infrastructure that would qualify uh, as projects that we that we can do. And then um, just on this last page, it's just a hodgepodge of a few things. Um, so, for example, grant administration. So uh, there's going to be some costs associated with us managing these grants. Uh, you heard from our finance director yesterday that. Um, that she's asking for an additional senior accountant. And one of the ways that we are proposing to fund that is through some grant funds. And not just this, although this will be a starting point for the next couple of years. Uh, but you know, there, there's a, if we did not have all of the grants, then we may not need an additional accountant to help manage it, even though we're, we are inundated by other tools, such as uh, in our toolbox, such as the PIDs and the TERS, and some of the other things. But if we didn't have the grants, on the other hand, we wouldn't be able to accomplish as much as that we're doing. So there's a trade-off, and one of those trade-offs is administration. So uh, that's one of the things that we're, we're asking for, is that regardless of decisions that we make, we set aside up to 10% of this to help with our administrative overhead for to manage this, these programs. 
Um, and then uh, just some of the other hodgepodge of asks. Uh, there's uh, tablets with Wi-Fi hotspots. I assume that was the library. Uh, so the library, about $6,500. And then uh, the possibility, I think uh, community development asked for that, and I don't see, um, I think we were in all on the neighborhood empowerment program. So um, I, I don't see her. Okay, community development. New neighborhood planning. Um, she submitted that to Ron. He may be able to address some additional questions, but in inheriting the neighborhood planning division, um, she set up an entire team and it includes, you know, neighborhood programs, it includes um, cleanups in neighborhoods. They're going to do a lot of different stuff with that program. All right, and so um, before we, we start asking council for feedback on where we might allocate these funds, I do want to let you know where we're at with our CARES money. So as you know, we received almost $3.9 million through various funding sources, um, Dallas County CRF, also at the state level, um, and uh, will be some CDBG types of funds uh, that uh, buckets of money at the state level we were, or the county level we were able to apply for, which we call the CESF. So, uh, council, um, you'll remember we have set aside uh, through various iterations, um, uh, several what we call robust funding cycles. Uh, I, did we finish four? Okay, we did four full cycles. So we have spent $996,000 now on uh, helping our local businesses with the impacts of the pandemic. There's about $76,000 left uh, out of the allocation that council made. Um, we did another update of this allocation, you'll remember, in January, where we made some additional tweaks. Um, in terms of individual assistance, uh, not so much. Um, we have spent $72,000. Uh, we've worked with the Salvation Army. We've tried to uh, work with some other uh, entities to try to help uh, manage this part of it. But we still have money there, almost uh, $480,000, that we have not been able to figure out how to allocate to help to uh, help with individual assistance, or those requests haven't been made. Food pantry, uh, some of our nonprofits, about fifty thousand. So we still have about fifty thousand dollars left um, out of the allocation that council made. City's COVID expenses, about one point two million. We've spent. We still have about one hundred eighty-seven thousand dollars left there. Um, that will bleed out over the course of the next few months. And then finally, um, there was a uh, just a block of dollars that we set aside, which we call clawback. And it's the recognition that out of such an expensive endeavor, almost $3.8 million, what if, what if we spent some funds that uh, the, the Treasury would later say don't, doesn't qualify and there would have to be some sort of clawback. Every day we know more than we knew before. Um, so, so we are prepared to have a discussion with Council. Is 750 still the right amount? Maybe it should be 500, 600. Uh, maybe it should be all three point eight million dollars. Who knows? But, but you know, or you know, so. But and and I'll say this: those funds are now one hundred percent rallied funds. So you don't have any restrictions on the seven fifty or the million five. Uh, uh, of the black man. She's adding it all. I don't have restrictions. What's left is. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're right. I, I don't think we have restrictions on the million five. No. We have commitments we've made that we yes. would have to recommit at yes. the council level, but we don't have restrictions. Very right. right. So once we made that application, the Treasury changed the rules, if you remember, many of the rules last September. And when they did that, it, it allowed us to be able to apply all of the public safety costs against that. And when we did that, we wiped out those funds. And then, so this is all policy now. It's no longer treasury restricted. It's policy restricted, however we allocate those funds. So uh, I wanted to make sure that you saw this before you started making uh, any other final decisions related to the ARPA funds. 
And kind of like to also pull in that, you know, we have, is it a million two out there in a capital, um, what, what, I don't know. Land acquisition there. Land acquisition, is it a million yeah. two? Yeah, around about a million two. Um, that we have preserved for future land acquisition. So that's another yes. pot of money that we should be making a decision with hand in hand with all this. Yep. Good point. And uh, here in a little bit, I'll, I'll have you know, we pull that other slide back up to kind of show what we've identified so far after we do this part we'll identify. But the mayor's right. So in addition to the 1.5, we also have that 1.2, and then we identified uh, possible surplus in this year, another half million there. And then we still had some money left over to allocate when we did the January uh, discussion. You don't, yeah. Uh, you don't have on here the generator for the community center. Is that no. because it's not uh, air? Are we calling it ARPA? Is that sure. everybody's calling it? Sure. Is that because it's not ARPA qualified? Yeah, we'll call it ARPA. Okay, is that because it's not part of qualified? Right. That's correct. But it could be kick this this CARES funding. It's yes. not CARES funding. I know. It's, okay. I know. I'm asking. That bucket, time. yes. Okay. Bucket one versus bucket two. She'll be here call it million two, bucket three. And bucket three. <laughs> okay. Yes. Right. Uh, back on you know a little while ago when you're talking utility sewer and water. Oh. Y'all can't hear me? No. Uh, no. I got to figure this out. It's out. It's out. Oh, okay. Uh, you said we we're going to have, uh, you've got two things on here, Dalrock Lift Station abandonment, abandonment and College Park Lift Station abandonment. When you abandon those, do they have generators associated with them? No, those will be something oldest and smallest. Okay. And, and it's a good, good point you, you're bringing up. Uh, if you had anything else, because there's a story I want to tell with it, but that's it. I was just going to say, if there's generators there, you can move them to work with So years ago, and I don't remember who put this together, but there were a series of pictures that uh, showing how well it has grown since inception. And, and like a lot of communities like this, uh, you start off with your core area, your, your town hall, Main Street area, and then neighborhoods start building up, and then you annex those uh, neighborhoods. And sometimes they don't always have the uh, quality infrastructure that you want. And so over time, we ended up um, annexing our way to the entire city of Raleigh um, landmass. And, and, and when you start to look at that, that's where a lot of those sewer lift stations would have been built over time to serve only a neighborhood or those kind of things. And then we made uh, infrastructure improvements later over time, maybe you were trying to bypass it or having the ability to bypass it, but didn't have the money at that point to connect it or to fix that. So part of the reason we have 25 or 26 lift stations in this town is because Rowlett, like many communities, was, was annexed over time in a hodgepodge fashion. Not to say that it wasn't you know, uh, calculated and, and, and thought out, but the desire was to incorporate uh, the entire the entire area, uh, what I always call the lungs of Rowland, because if you look at it, it looks like a set of lungs. And, um, and so in, in making those conscious decisions at that time also meant that some of the infrastructure was put in at a time when we did not put in generators. Some of the more recent ones we do, but there's still the 13 we don't. So only about half of our lift stations have generators, and I would bet you that most of those are your uh, the ones that have been built most more recently. A good question, sir. So uh, as the mayor has identified, we we have money here, and um, excuse me, back to this. So we have money with cares. We still have the 1.2 we're preserving for. Uh, for future land acquisition, we have um, we still have about a half million dollars, uh, about four hundred eighty thousand, I think, out of the bucket that we discussed in January that we chose not to allocate at that time, and then we have about a half million dollars and surplus out of this year's money that we've also identified. So that gives us a lot of one-time choices. It doesn't necessarily fix all the ongoing. Um, cost that we might have, but 
We, uh, like every year, there we have resources. Even in a tight year, we're not getting much money this year in the general fund, uh, or at least not initially, we didn't think, from uh, the property tax, sales taxes we are. And some of the decisions we make will also benefit the general fund, but that's, that's kind of where we're at. So what I would like to do is have a conversation with you at this point about you know, where, where are some of the priorities that you see? I mean, I would hope that you will agree on the generators. I would love to set aside the money to abandon those two list stations because we're going to end up paying for that somewhere in, in the next couple of years. Um, and most likely will be out of our operating funds, um, our, our capital uh, maintenance dollars. And we would rather not have to use that if we didn't have to. You wouldn't really want a um, bond, a 20 year bond to abandon. That's what I'm saying. So that's cash. And that frees cash up to do other things that we need to do with the utility fund. Why can't you just keep those there indefinitely? That's a million dollars per lift station to take down. There, there, is, uh, there is work that they have to do to close it down. Um, they, they, um, and I, and uh, I can't even explain all the things that they do, but it's not just turn it off. I you didn't know, say they, that. Sorry. I didn't say just turn it off. I'm saying they're operating today it doesn't cost a million dollars a year to operate these. I'm not sure why we would want to spend a million dollars times two or close to it to shut them down. Part, part of the issue is in designing the Bayside lift station, they were designed in place to be able to eliminate those stations. So uh, it's an efficiency issue. Um, it saves money by not having to, uh, to operate those three lift stations. And it was designed specifically to be able to do that. Again, I get all that, but it's almost $2 million to shut them down, and we can continue operating them less efficiently and not spend $2 million on shutting something down. So, so what you're really asking is what's the ROI on it? Yeah. And the rate of return. So the rate of return might be 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, in right. terms of the cost of running it versus spending a million dollars now or two million dollars yeah. now. I don't know how to make that decision without additional information on those okay. lift stations. All right. I understand how to make a decision on generation generators for lift station, but shutting them down for that kind of money, I don't have enough information. Okay. Can we talk a little bit, because y'all you all put some lists together that were specifically related to ARPA funds, ARPA restrictions. Can we talk a little bit about other things that might be on the list that we could use the unrestricted funds for, just so that we're not just focusing on the list that's provided, but we have, like, for instance, I wrote down two things, and there's probably a million more. Um, funding the golf fund could come out of these unrestricted CARES funds. Um, you know, uh, increasing our facilities uh, reserves, if you will, from a million two to some of this money. So there's, those are just two things I just wrote down real quickly um, that you couldn't use the ARPA funds for, but you could use some of this unrestricted CARES funds for. Yep. Um, is that a, can we do that for a few minutes, or would you all rather not do that? Well, I, I don't know. I, I, think, I think it's a good question because we need to understand what money can be spent on what and where, what buckets. And this is unrestricted. Right. Mm -hmm. It's unrestricted. Unrestricted one time. Hmm? Unrestricted one time. Okay. Unrestricted one time money. But, you know, building up a golf fund reserve is one time, one time money. You know, you, you build it up. You put in enough for the next three years, you've reduced your need to take that out of operating cash, you know. Well, I have a question, like the chief was talking about, they've been using the money to pay for their software out of, mm -hmm. go back to my notes, mm -hmm. can that be taken out of our funds? Not our, not our part, but unrestricted care, yes. He's been using the seizure funds. The seizure funds. Yeah. Is yeah. One, the, uh, and did I take you off course, Brian? Do you want to do it a different way? No, that's fine. I was told today was to kind of do a recap and blending it together is perfectly fine. But to do a recap for you to know all the resources that are available to you 
you uh, before we make, start making giving final guidance. Now understand, you're not today, and I wouldn't even ask for this of you, but you're not you're not here to say, well, I want that department to have that pickup, or I want that position to be hired. But <coughs> any guidance that you're, it's more strategy level guidance as we kind of get into the final 30, 40 days. So, um, let's see what time. Did I capture all of this yet? So, it's, it's 6.8, it's the 1.5 here, it's the one time in January, the 480,000, no. it's the surplus retail. Oh, that, that, that. Uh, half million, the one time January is rolled into the CARES funding. It's all one oh, okay. pot. Yeah. Yes. Kind of yes, all of that is accounted for in that number. Are you questioning? Are you financing? We lost half. And I am double checking, and I will correct myself if I'm wrong, but. <laughs> Well, remember how we also moved it out of employee wellness money and then we had... Yes, but money. that, I netted everything together and the balance was rolled in. We acted as if we spent the employee health benefits fund first. What was left over was CARES money that we had transferred to the general fund and that net is rolled in to what's left okay. here. Okay, that's good. That's fair. And then, um, we, and just as... Oh, one point two for the... That, that's what I was just going to talk about. My... I would not, just me personally, would not like to lump the land acquisition 1.2 into money that could be looked at for spending at one time because we don't know what's going to happen as Northside develops and, and other land that we don't acquire or own within the city. And if we don't do some type of park, this goes back to my strategic plan, if we don't do some type of park dedication or park um, uh, ordinance where we, there might be some land there that we want to purchase from a developer so that we maintain public space and park space as we continue to grow because we don't have anywhere else to go. And so my recommendation is, is we don't consider the land acquisition money at this point and kind of hold that until we have a better plan for what's going to happen on North Shore. That's just my two cents. Yeah, and we may need to use it for an incentive, exactly. not just park. But exactly. the, the reason I brought it up is it is another bucket that's out there, and we may want to add to it for some of this CARES money. Yeah. That makes sense. I don't know that how it's being put up there is it's money that we might want to use as a right. one time fund, and I would be against that. Yeah, I just want to say, as far as the generators go, um, I am definitely in favor of funding that. Uh, we're short staffed in public works anyway. Um, and they talk about how hard the work is, the burnout, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, when those generators are needed, it is probably under the worst conditions that those guys can possibly work in. Uh, and so I, just, I, I feel like we owe it to them uh, and to those workers to give them the tools that they need without them having to haul it from one lift station to another. Um, it's just burdensome, and, and uh, I really feel like we need to provide those generators. Well, Martha, I appreciate that. It's a good point because it is absolutely usually during the, the worst um, you know, um, weather condition, worst conditions. Um, they, they're doing that when they can be out there walking off streets and uh, addressing other issues. you got to have a team of people dedicated nothing but that. And also, that's a hazardous waste field just waiting to happen. Yes, it is. Yeah, good point. Brownie, Brownie is making the point that, you know, if we fail at this, um, you know, we, it could result in a sewer spill into the lake or wherever. And then that requires uh, EPA notification, requires cleanup. Um, so there's other expenses that, that could end up happening if we had a major spill. A whole bunch of news cameras. Yeah. So, um, uh, so, <laughs> Looking at the staff suggestions uh, for the ARPA funds, um, the, obviously the generators, like we're all saying, the water line looping, I think, is very critical. Um, so it said install water pipes are going to make dead end water lines. This improves drinking water quality and resiliency and reliability of the system. Also, um, what that does is we don't have to flush hydrants. Uh, all across the city, uh, and uh, it helps us in a ISO rating review, 
where we could end up being a class one ISO rating and reduce that, and in turn reduces commercial insurance rates, which also makes our community more um, economically, uh, I guess, attractive. Yeah. So I'd say waterline would be, for me, it's, it's also one of those top priorities. On this uh, list of sewer and water for ARPA, I'm curious which of these are in the plans for future capital projects in the normal course of our business with issuing, uh, you know, special utility bonds, and um, which are above and beyond that plan. We, we, we've got that, Mayor. We'll, we'll pull it up here. In a minute. I know, I know, y'all been working with Gary on that. So let's see. Or what's the best way to do that? I'm not sure there is a spreadsheet. I have my budget book to show like what was what has been. Um, what has the microphone budgeted in uh, for the future, like for other? My yeah. question is: some of this is already planned in the short term, medium term, and long term plan. Yes. That's already and budgeted. I think we're right. how much in bonds are we proposing every year for water and sewer? Seven. Seven. So, you know, our water and sewer fund is in good shape. We're funding it where we need to be. We we have that debt service capability in the future. Um, so I, I don't want to double dip here. Well, we need to we need to be careful not to sue. We already have a plan in the paper. We can't use our. That's a plan. Um, that's a big word. So is that something that he, that he might be able to answer? He might be able to answer. If it's a project that we've already identified in the funding plan, are we still allowed to come back and use these ARPA funds to pay for a project that might be identified in the funding plan? It's a plan. So water and sewer is a little easier because water and sewer is blocking the bonds. Is that the one you're talking about? The seven million? Um, the identified project list that we have. This right here is what we're proposing. Uh, you know, saying because we have a plan to pay for this much in bond election. I've been That doesn't make it to where we can't fund that through our okay. plans. So, okay, good point. Yeah. So, so here's the deal. Let's say we issue the seven million for 12 projects this year. And then we could identify one of those that we want to use out of this money, then we could end up um, using the um, the bond money for another water and sewer project. That's not the question. Yeah, no. My, <laughs> so my question is, and the list that we have that has identified projects, okay. forget, I guess, forget the bond, okay. forget that the bond's in it. We have a list of identified projects. Um, and we have a funding plan attached to that. Our funding plan is basically through general funders, through funding, and through uh, bond elections. Okay. But that, that plan exists. Uh, would, it, would we still be able to come back and pay for one of those items through ARPA funds? If, I, you know, oh, yes. Okay. So your question is the mere fact that it's identified as a, part, as a five year plan, right. or even if it's adopted budget, would we be able to use the ARPA funds to do that? And the answer is yes. Okay. Now, I know the reason you're asking that there are funds that we have from time to time that will not allow what they call supplantion, like the police so, uh, seizure fund. Yes. So, uh, but no, we don't have that restriction to worry about. So, and, and remember, too, even on a five year plan, we adopt the first five years as a budget. The other years are really just um, planned years. So, we can definitely move that around. All right. So, um, so is it, I think it's the backup power. Isn't it? Um, Just so you know, we can't read that from over here. Uh, can we increase this, the no, size? No, I don't think you need to. What I'm asking is on this list, yeah. on this ARPA list of sewer and water, which of these projects already has a plan for funding? You can so, just tell us. College Park Blue Station, is that one? Yep. Yeah, I think yes. all of them. So College Park is one. Down on the other one. Which yeah. is the other one? Uh, the Lucas. 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 Lucas.
Back up power. So everything's on there? Bunch of it. Yeah. There was also a uh, sewer line. Water main looping. Line 11. So it looks like Gary pretty much took what was on the top of his list that he would want done right. sooner and put it on here mm -hmm. so that he and, and, I, and I understand having the same list. I just, we've got to think big picture strategically here because we've already made decisions on how to fund water and sewer infrastructure and we have a very good plan. Now, if something has come up higher in a priority, like generators for lift stations, maybe. Right. But I don't. I'm not so sure we would supplant the plane. I totally agree. No. But you're also you're you're also by uh, I guess allocating funding to these top priorities, you're allowing more investment uh, through the plan that we have for other projects. For water and sewer projects. Right. Which are. Uh, a specific fund coming from specific revenue sources. Right. Some of these other suggestions for ARPA funds are not restricted to water and sewer funds. Right. So you got to be careful with that. Yeah. There's not another funding source for these non-water and sewer fund projects, but there is a funding source for these for sewer and water projects. And, and so that's where I need to understand a little bit better the ARPA funds, and I understand there's some restrictions. Is there other stuff that's outside of the utility sewer and water and the broadband that we can spend ARPA funds on? I don't understand that enough yeah, about what else is out there, what else we can spend uh, it's, it on. It's one of those reasons. These, these are, these are the, uh, I guess, I guess, okay, so one reason you're not seeing streets and alleys is you can't do that. Um, there are other there are other projects that um, you know I can't hire a social media as a person out of out of these funds. So what we what we've tried to do is identify programs that we thought would qualify under the system that we also knew were super important. And had they had different restrictions, then you might be seeing a different list. So I can't hire police officers with it. I can't uh, can't buy a fire truck out of it. Yeah, you know, those are things I cannot do that we were having active conversations this weekend about. Is it, a, is it an approach, and I'm asking, I'm sincerely asking, is it an approach to potentially fund these other items, um, not necessarily first from a, it happens first, but from an allocation, if you will. You know, it's, it's a million dollars for utilities, broadband, and it's 788000 for other, and I'm, we can go through each one. But then we still have millions of dollars of ARPA funds to kick off, to knock off some of these sewer and water projects um, that accelerate some of our capital improvements in that system, but don't also, you know, take away all that funding source that we've already identified. So to the mayor's point, and that, that's really where I was going to come with it, and Ron and I kind of talked about, is that if we're able to knock off some of these others, he's able to accelerate his plan. We're not proposing, even with this money, we're not proposing to, to change the funding cycle at this point. We, we have reached a, a level of Nirvana by, by annually funding a certain amount and with a strategy of increasing that funding by 10% per year. So in our mind, if we're able to knock off some of the more critical items, all that's going to do is be able to accelerate some of the other programs or projects that you can't get to yet. Yeah, I agree. I'm just saying from a priority standpoint, again, not when you do the project, but prioritizing the money, use the ARPA funds for these other two things and then a couple of select sewer and water projects and then you're kind of accomplishing both goals. Can I add something on that? Looking at that, I had already done that allocation to see if we spent, if we did broadband first. Okay, sorry. Okay, so I looked at it, and if we go with that approach, um, doing broadband, administrative, and then the other items, that's 26% of the funding, and then it leaves you about $5 million which is 
of the funding left to allocate to water sewer projects? Yeah, I mean, I think actually very quick one three. Oh, there's quite a bit of discrepancy between the cost there that's on the screen and then what's here on the sheets. This is last year. This is the adopted budget. So this would have been last summer. Wait, wait, no, no, no. That uh, is that. This? See, this starts in fiscal year twenty two. This is what is going to be proposed for this current budget and the next oh, five years. No, so. because we did originally, but then we because each so year, mm -hmm. each year we have to reevaluate each year what's going on with the system and may have to shift projects around. So this is where it landed this year. That's going to be proposed for the projects. In this coming proposed, so so in essence, which one's the, the more accurate number? Is it this? But, but, but what they're saying is the discrepancy in between the cost that Gary listed here uh -huh. versus the cost there. I don't know if it has to do with well, him saying the full project within this scope versus maybe that is. Uh, we have we have the uh, the kids here, and I'm just making sure everybody can hear. Oh, for example, like the College Park lift station is only half a million there, and it's eight hundred seventy-seven thousand on the, on the SAR machine. So the price went up by three hundred thousand dollars. Is it phasing it in? If we do it now, if we just left it alone, it'd be five fifty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's how that's supposed to work. <laughs> Something's wrong. Works so I don't know about that. But in like the water line a little bit, you've only got two million down here, but the total price up there is why? Because in part, we would be spreading that out over years. So, so we're only talking about a partial. I didn't hear that. Yeah. Wait. What? You know what I'm saying? See the water line? It's 3.4 in the total I think problems. She's, right. I think she's gonna we can get them on the phone, but I don't know how much it's going to help. <laughs> Exactly. So that's why, I, you know, if we're deciding what we're going to put in these buckets, which numbers are we using to put in buckets? Because I'm confused. Which one's right? Well, uh, the finance, I think, didn't balance. Well, no, we worked that. with CIP. No. Well, we worked with Public Works to do that list. He just may have. What's in this with the ARPA funds may be more enhanced project. Like this is the minimum. This could be the minimum to get by because this is how the city is funding it. Whereas maybe it could be a better project if we have ARPA funds to fund it. But I will call him and find out like specifically like the water looping. And also that you said the college park. Yeah. I'll ask him like, what's the difference in the price between what we put in the five-year plan versus what the ARPA funding. Yeah. Yeah, because the water I, I was just going to say we're not going to solve that here. Um, but do you all like that approach? You say that. Okay, so for ARPA funds, make sure we fund what we want to fund. We can talk through it on this broadband page and this other uses page. Yes. Go through those items and then see how much that adds up to ish. And then look at the water and sewer fund, uh, page and say we could still fund the generators with ARPA funds and we could still generate uh, uh, fund the looping and that's our approach we want to take. That, yeah, I think that's a good approach. I think when yeah. I did the math, it's about 3.3 .3 million that would be left over if we funded everything on the other uses and broadband. Broadband would be about 3.3 .3 just in the ARPA funds. My only, and then as we get into the utility funds, one thing to think about, I would recommend is that we, since we have to 2024, to extend yes. those to money, the, yeah. is that we keep a percentage of it aside in case we, so if we had a big um, water line or sewer line break that we weren't expecting, like we've had in a couple of years, that's, you know, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars to fix. Would we be able to use that if we had some reverse to be able to fund that fix? Yeah, so, so we have until the end of uh, calendar year 24 to spend the money, right? So, so uh, or encumbered by that. And so, um, if so, we obviously would not necessarily spend all six point eight million dollars in the next few months anyway because we don't even have half of them yet, but um. But if some of it has to be engineered and designed um, before we can even start construction, then um, that puts us off. And that's one of the reasons why 
they knew, they knew that with the CARES money, there was such an intensity of having to spend it before the end of last calendar year, a lot of organizations had trouble doing that. Whereas with this, they, they kind of extended that out and gave us basically three years. So yes, if we identified something now and it still took us a couple of years before we finished the project, that's okay. Or we could set some aside if we had for emergency repairs. Um, I, I, would, I would hazard a guess on the emergency repairs, maybe not, because it's supposed to be investments in instead of repairs. But we have some money set aside. If you remember back in January, we had some leftover utility money, and council at that point wanted to set some of that, those dollars aside for emergencies uh, in the future. Okay. Well, that, that answers that. Yeah, the, the, the list that was up here before, um, the first one that was put up there was the 66 uh, water main, and that one's been that one has been new. It's costing us the most with emergency funding over the last year. I think there was like three different uh, breaks in the system there. So that one's, you know, that's probably going to be funded through the um, uh, bonds anyway that we have. So, um, so are we going to select here like? Well, I, I, I like the mayor's approach. This is more about strategy. So, yeah. uh, and the one thing, if you go to the last slide, um, Laura, it might be the second to the last, I'm, gonna, I'm in charge of that. Uh, <laughs> uh, this one. So, so really, what we, were, what we were trying to say, you'll remember a, a similar format we used for the CARES money. How much do we want to allocate for health businesses and individuals? How much do we need for our own expenses? How much do we set aside for in case COVID got worse? You remember that mantra that we had. So it's the same thing here. How much do we want to allocate for administration? How much do we want to allocate for other purposes? How much for broadband? This is the mayor's approach that she was mentioning um, in terms of the larger buckets. Now, you know, yes, I, I would love for you to say specifically that, Brian, the generators uh, are number one on our list, and we need to make that happen. And then that, that's enough specificity that I'm going to tell Gary and start making it happen even now. But some of the other stuff really is just, you know, what other things would you want to do? You've seen staff's list, but are you, and we know we have some CARES money left, you know, do we want to use any of these funds for those other things that we, we did during the CARES, with the CARES money? Or are we focused just on these things? I just don't want you to lose an opportunity if there's one you think we need. Like, do we want to do more robust funding? You know, that kind of stuff. All right, let's let's stick with Aqua for a minute. Let's look at the broadband page. Does anybody have any concerns about anything on the broadband page? Broadband page. Sapphire Bank. Want to talk. What, what, can you explain that one a little bit more? When is that needed? So, um, you know, kind of going back to the whole, uh, the fires, sorry. Did you hear that? Um, the question about the fiber cell yes. thing. Yes. When is that needed? What is that to serve? That's fire and police. So we wouldn't need that. Is that engineering? Is that actually running the fiber? Can you just talk through that piece? So I don't, I don't have the map up there, but uh, as you guys know, the way that our, um, our fiber ring works is that we have connectivity um, to the new fire station number two. So there is, there are two connections from there to go down Chisa or to go down McDowell Rock. And each one has a cost associated with it. What he, what we're trying to do is to have our broadband in there by the time that fire station number five will be open. So connected, cause that's, that's our facility. We're not running broadband down there for Sapphire Bay, for the resort and all those things. We're running it down there for our purposes. And so, you know, he he would like to have this done within the next two years. Well, I think, as we talked about yesterday, there's more, in my opinion, there's more of a discussion to have there and would take that 100000 off for it. Unless, well, right. unless we're already doing a fiber project in the city and get a lot of time. Yeah. I, I personally recommend leaving it there because I think either way we're going to have to have fire down there anyway and um, it's better to use it through these funds instead of general fund or taxpayer dollars. Well, there's an outdoor wind siren down there too that no. need to tap it. Yeah. 
And I think it's a big fiber project, you know, all these things. Yeah. I would leave it in there. I hear you, Matt, but I would leave it in there. I'd leave it in there. And so, so. Yeah, well, and, and I was going to say, you know, there may be some economies of scale that you can tap into if there's other utilities that are, I, I don't know if we have to tunnel uh, or bury uh, that fiber cable or not, but you got to get it across I-30. Well, and it's already, they, when, they, when they designed uh, the, uh, let's call it the tunnels under I-30 for water and sewer and all that, broadband was part of what they did, the, the, those kind of utilities. So it's so the conduit is there, but we still have to run it from one location down there, and the running of it is uh, is what's going to cost us almost one hundred thousand dollars. Why do we need fiber to uh, community park? I'll tell you. So currently, we currently have staff at community park, and we have our entire parks division houses out there, and likely will for a while. And they run all of their operations off of a MiFi. Oh. Off of what? A MiFi. Oh no. Mm. Because there is no fiber to the community park. Now we will have to be part of that anyway as part of the outdoor warning siren and the fiber connections as a part of that, so that will help us. But they run their entire system, their network, off of individual Wi-Fi devices because they don't have service. They don't have fiber networking at the park. Is that like a hot spot? No. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have we have four permanent offices and thirteen staff or station. Well, interesting. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I would agree that both of them, Does anybody have any other broadband issues, concerns, questions? What about the other list? I personally am not prepared to spend $100,000 on a neighborhood empowerment program without knowing to have a lot more. <laughs> but um, we've got co ed, we've got CERT, we've got all kinds of stuff. But. I should have asked this before. I wonder if I have a dean that's supporting the hotspots. I'm sorry, what you have? I should have asked Laura before for the library if they had any data to support the need for those hotspots. Because the school system is already doing that with all of their kids. They've got a big program for that to address the gap there. So I'm wondering what. Um, population they're trying to serve with those hot spots. It's not the kids. I, I don't think it's the kids. I believe it is adults and seniors. It's not a big ticket item. It's not a lot of money. I'm just wondering. But I will tell you this if, if we go through this, if through our operating budget and those limitations, it won't make the list. So if we have the opportunity to do it here, it might, it might make the list. So um, I'm not personally saying I don't support the neighborhood empowerment program, but I don't think it's allocable dollars at this point in time without loan capital a lot more. But you leave it on. I would say leave it on. This has something to do with disasters. Could you explain that one? Yeah, I want to explain it to you. I think I think generally and at a very general level. It's a resiliency program, right? So it's the idea that once you are already um, subject to the disaster, you're trying to make sure that the people within that neighborhood are able to bounce back in a short period of time. So to give you an example, um, when I was in New Orleans, I ran a similar type of program. One of the things we have is um, points of distribution with medicine. So you may have a hot service set up that uh, you've gone door to door asking, uh, maybe some of your elderly, some of your children, what medicines do you need if something were to happen, a disaster happens, when you've already got a certain amount of, you know, in accordance with FEMA guidelines, a certain amount of access built in that you can bring those resources in quickly. Same for like food pantries, things well, yeah, like that. I don't know if you're familiar with our co ed, but that is the role of our co ed. Yeah. So it's, it's a program that. Yeah, and, and those are very much, um, 
uh, aspects of that type of program. That's why I said on a very general level, what she's asking for is money set aside. And the reason I think that's put in there is if you go to the enabling legislation here, it says everything that you do should be able to tie into COVID or being able to build your resiliency to you know, disaster type situations in the future, right? So I think the idea is you know that you have a population that is impacted and some areas are gonna come back slower than others. And the legislation actually says that the way Congress will uh, kind of look at and review these things for eligible costs, they're being a lot more liberal in their interpretations when you're taking in equity and inclusion. So I think that was her idea. Then I would uh, support that uh, 100% and whatever dollar amount is appropriate, if that said, uh, to fund the co-ed for future emergencies. I, I don't want to set up a whole new program. We already have CERT, we already have co-ed. Um, if it's funding to existing programs and make our existing programs more robust, I think that's the direction to go, not create a new program. Yeah, yeah, and I, I agree with that. I think also uh, allocating between the COAD and CERT, um, because that's, again, that's both of their missions, is, is that exact thing, disaster preparedness. I think that's a good point. It's no different, really, than the money we set aside for golf maintenance for projects out there, setting aside money here for future. It may be education, it could be um, just that, you know, preparation, short about weaknesses out there, you know, that would help support our communities if there was a disaster. So yeah. I and think that's and, a really good point. Man. And also purchasing some equipment to help in those disaster situations. Good. So how about So you? is everybody okay with the the other loose other uses list? All right, so does that leave us enough to cover a couple of immediate priorities that we want covered for water and sewer? Look like it's 1.8 for those two pages, broadband and, and uh, yeah, 1.8, so you got 3.3. So 3.3 would be left. Probably. So, how do we Should we allocate or, or give guidance to allocate? for the half of the money that we have now and then have another session where we get the other half next year because we don't have the full of six point eight now. I, I personally would like to make big decisions okay. and then make a littler decision of what's first. But those decisions can change in the future. Right. That, that's what I'm saying. But I think we should think yeah. about the entire amount right now. The whole amount. Well at, at one point, like on even the generators, um, it's still you know, in my mind, what we would do is we would go out for a bid to get them all. But it's still going to take a year and a half to, to actually get them all installed. You know, because even if you did one contract, you're still going to end up doing, they're not going to build all 13 at one time. So um, we want to go, like, so generators for load stations, obvious. But like I said before, water line would be, but that's I sure we have five million. Where? What's the three point eight? Oh, uh, we the three point eight. So with the generators, the other list of broadband, we would have three point eight left. Okay, I'm just starting with six point eight two. Okay. Yeah. Minus one point. Yes. Zero. Six eight two zero minus. Hang on. Six eight two zero minus one zero one eight. Minus 788 gives us 5 million. Right. So let's just go after the utilities. Right. Okay. And the question is does that give us enough and are we still okay with the macro approach? It funds. Uh, yeah, as long as there's no other, other uses of broadband that we need to consider. If it funded generators and water line looping, we'd still have another million too. Maybe you can get one of those lift stations offline. Maybe. Is that like flushing? Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd also take a look at the 66 um, main, since we're continuing to have those failures yes. on the loose, and it's costing us a heck of a lot. The sooner they are working on it right now, so Gary is putting together a plan and we're putting together a plan for all of the Highway 66 sewer. 
situation from a the plan. Huh? So just a plan of funding? No, it is a funding plan. So from McDonald's all the way down, down the lake and up to Chisa, around that way, and all the way up to the edge of the coast. And is that on this list or his? I mean, well, that's, that's I think it's bits and parts of that and how it will get done. They have funding right now to work on the one that goes along the lake and up 66 at Chiza in that area, and then we will the other day, and then the next section. So, yeah, I mean, we could save that million too for the next big project. That would pay for our trying to do is get anywhere that they have pipe issues so that it doesn't right. turn into an emergency room. Right. Yeah, because it's a cast iron and it's, it's so old. Um, but most of these are in there. So, can I come up with a map just on our audience too? I'm going to, uh, yeah, sure. But help me with that. So, if we have the generators, the other list, the broadband, um, and then the looping project, I think you'd like, wasn't that two million even? Uh huh. Okay, so back here. And then the generators are, I think, 1.8. Oh, I just wanted to write it back. Okay, sorry about that. 1.8, so that's 3.2. That leaves us with 1.2. That, that's what it is. Thank okay. you. Let's pause for a minute. What do you all think, Tom? So I'm going to pass the microphone along. What do you want to change? What do you like or don't like? I like that. <laughs> I'm talking about too. I agree. <laughs> I guess we could just kind of thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, I agree with you. I like preserving the 1.2 for a future project. Is there the 1.2? Are we going to go to the first list station and have a ribbon cutting for the generator? <laughs> what did you say? Go, go to the first uh, generator installed and have a ribbon cutting at the, at the lift station. <laughs> um, so, so, that pretty, that, so, okay. you pass the microphone out. This is the Mark Brown list station. Whose name are we going to put on that list? This isn't discussing what we're going to do in the I got a couple of minutes. You didn't get the microphone to ask me a question. I know. That's right. I was like, why do you want to get that microphone? No, this is just discovery, discussing our microphone. It's not the other one. This is just our program. Gosh, okay. We'll go back. I have a question. Okay. We need microphone. Like, we need microphone. Lazy Susan, is that what they put up on this? Um, I should have asked Gary this yesterday. How long are we on um, fuel tankers? Like, how, how does he fuel the, the generators currently? And does he have a need there to do that? Yeah, they, they're actually, they have one. Um, I think that, uh, but they, that was one thing that was originally on the list. I don't think he discussed it yesterday to try to acquire another one. But, oh, actually, Blake may know something. Uh, I, I saw that on the enterprise replacement plan to replace that truck with a new fuel truck. That, that's what it is. Yeah, that, that's why it's buried in that. That's why. Do you know how many gallons it was? Uh, see, here's the thing. Some of these generators are natural gas powered and some are diesel powered. I don't know how many of those are natural and how many of those are diesel, but I don't know the size. There, there are enough of them out there that are diesel. Um, but where we have access, we use natural gas if we can. Okay. I just want to make sure we have a big enough fuel tank that they're not running back and forth in yeah. an emergency yeah. situation. So that they have a big enough tank so they can fill up, hit them all, before they have to go back and refill up. And, um, if that's a piece of equipment, I mean, that's something that might fall underneath this, that we can help with that. It, it's a Ford F 350 diesel truck with a small tank on it. That gives you a bit of Like a 100 gallon. So, oh, yeah, yeah, to me, that's, that's not enough. You need like a 500 gallon, you know. You need like a dump truck. A mini tank. Like a little mini tank on it that you can get around to all of those so you're not having to go back and forth from, from the fuel station. Where that answer? All right. I knew it was a tank on a decent generator. Uh, uh, it is. So depends on the KPA. I mean, the, the tank for the uh, the OC is like, like I mean, it's massive. Uh, it's like a couple thousand gallons. Uh, no, it's more than that. All right, we'll get an answer for that one. 
I need to, can we, yes, so can we so right. then we'll go back to the care thing? I'm sorry. Yeah, like, no, we have the wrong answer, so let's do the food. Um, so take a few minutes, get your, get your meals, uh, and then during the time, we'll do the legislative update. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. We're back on. We're back live. So for your entertainment during lunch, I'm going to cover the legislative issues. Uh, great news this year, there wasn't a significant number of bills passed, not passed, vetoed, that affected the way we as a city government operate. So what we're going to do today is kind of talk about just the highlights some of the things that we're going to look at over the next several months, how to make those, those things happen. Um, 87th legislature, by the numbers, there were 6,927 bills introduced or filed. Of that, 1,071 bills passed. Uh, in the 86th legislature, just as reference, 1,429 bills passed. Uh, as you know, they had a lot of conversations and, and so a little bit of drama going on up there this time. So uh, there are potential sessions to come. I saw yesterday that they had called a summer session on July the 8th. Um, and they likely will also have a fall session. So in summer, they predict they will talk about election integrity, bail reform, and anything else they didn't wrap up from the last session. Um, in the fall, they will come back again to discuss redistricting and their $16 billion worth of ARPA funds. So, still more to come on some of those topics. Um, there were a lot of bills that didn't make the cut. And I'll just kind of cover these in broad topics. Um, copy this off the TML slide, that's why everybody's laughing at me. So, community censorship, sales tax sourcing, Partisan city elections, that was one of the topics that it require city elections to put whether or what party they fell within. Um, preemption of city regulations and state licenses, expansion of video conferencing and teleconferencing, land development, shot clock expansion. Uh, that is one that Manola was very worried about and did watch very closely uh, because it would have altered how they did business over a community development. ETJ removal, uh, mandatory sick leave, chickens, rabbits, and bees. Yeah. They talked quite a bit about farm animals. Um, omnibus disaster authority during a pandemic, uh, extension of chapter 313 incentives, preemption of city employment regulations, and expanded liability for the ballot language. Do you, do you, I'm sorry, does anybody know what the ETJ one, what's the gist of that one was? Uh, what was that? They want to get rid of them. Like completely? Well, so if you had ETJ, it was just going to automatically become part of the city. They want to take away, no, they want, they want to take away local control. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 so cities ETJ. won't be able to, to do anything with ETJ. So you can't charge. That's what they does not change. And, and they one did thing test. that they, they didn't talk specifically about was upcharging if you lived right. in the ETJ. So if you um, lived in the city of Outlet, ETJ, not only would you be billed for your ambulance services that you got as a medical service, but you could also be billed for our services to come to your house and provide the public safety services that we typically provide. Hmm. So, um, what were cities worried about that didn't pass um, in their original format? So there was a lot of changes during the legislature. There was a community censorship bill that would have prevented cities from hiring advocates or joining associations that advocate for their cities in the capital. Does that, uh, does that get a special section, session? I know that the lieutenant governor wanted it to. No, probably not. I don't think so. I hope. It's not on the list yet. It's not on the list yet. Not yet. Okay. And the list is in process. So I think they must have just called the session in the last couple of days because I saw it yesterday. So yeah, they did. I'm not sure what all is going to end up coming back. Um, a debt bill that in its early form would have prevented the issuance of most COs for infrastructure projects by requiring that they're paid from from maintenance operations side of the property tax rate, a bill that would have harmfully expanded the application of the calendar, calendar shot clocks in the building permitting and land developing fields, 
a super preemption bill that would have prevented many city regulations from applying to any state license holder. Um, legislation that required sick and injury leave for first responders that was duplicative of already existing workers' compensation laws, and a bill that would have prevented cities from regulating backyard agricultural practices. So, bunnies, pigs, chickens. So, um, it would have definitely had an impact on our community development department and our code enforcement department. Some that did pass, oh, I guess I have to click the thing, sorry. Repeat it I get sidetracked and forget to click the button. So some that did pass that are community development related, uh, SB 877, building inspections. Um, this modifies city building inspection requirements during declared disasters. It basically does not require our building official or our team to go out and do inspections. Um, it is effective immediately. It may require a change in our fees, but it will let someone hire an outside building official to come in and do their inspection during a, during a disaster. Uh, Board of Adjustment, it outlines consistency when VOA is granting zoning variances in hardship situations. Our community development team and our VOA will now be to specifically outline what those hardships are um, and what they will, how that will affect how they grant variances. And then unlawful restraint of a dog. Um, this made it all the way through and then got vetoed by the governor. Um, it basically outlined a more humane standard of care for dogs as well as enforcement mechanisms for that. Farmer's market, it changes how we charge fees for farmer's market. Uh, the city runs our farmer's market, so we don't charge our participants a inspection or a health permit fee. This sets up a system where your fee can exceed $100 for an entire year for every farmer's market type of event you have in your city. So if they meet those restrictions to be a farmer's market vendor, then it's one flat fee and they're permitted for the whole year. Um, it went into effect June the 14th. Um, and they will reallocate their fee schedule to make sure that those vendors aren't charged. Food establishment, it allows a restaurant to sell unprepared food directly to an individual. Um, it will increase inspection time. It went into effect June 4th, and there's no state license required um, if you want to do that. And basically that is a restaurant being able to prepare to-go meals that you cook it up. Um, so we have several in town that, we have several businesses in town that do that. This will allow all restaurants to do that now. Police department, body worn cameras, House Bill 929, uh, related directly to law enforcement policies and procedures regarding body worn cameras. It will become effective September 1st and basically states that a peace officer has to keep their body camera activated from the beginning to the end of the interaction. Um, it can only go off in the sense that the body camera failed, so they can't at any point turn off their body camera. Um, unlicensed handgun carry is money of you know, House Bill 1927 authorized anyone over the age of 21 years of age and not otherwise prohibited by law um, for possessing a firearm to carry a firearm. That goes into effect September the 1st. Um, we talked to Michael Godfrey, Chief Godfrey, about it, and he said it's really an education process with his officers now to make sure they understand anybody can carry at any time. Um, the state, Brownie, I know one of the questions you could ask is about an online class or a training class for those folks. The state is working through that, and I think the Department of Public Safety is in the process of developing an online class that you can take that will teach you about safety of weapons. Not shall, but can. Can, <laughs> absolutely, you don't have to. Uh, peer support, this is a big one for our police department, SB 64. It instructs that the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, TCLOS, will have to create a peer support system for law enforcement agencies across the state. And that's effective immediately. <laughs> There's only a few more. Um, what does that mean, TCLOS? So basically, they will set up a system that is peer support. So in an emergency, they may have an emergency team that comes out. Um, 
This is the board system across the state for different officers. Mental health. Yeah. So if you have yeah. a critical incident, that you're, you're, you're saying physical health. Okay, right? so it's not a buddy system. It's all. Yeah. It's a program. Yeah. Yes. Got it. And they they are still working on that. So a lot of the stuff, it's either got into effect immediately or it's about to go in effect, and it will wait on guidelines from TNM and from DPS and from T Close and all the different folks that are involved. So. Paid quarantine leave uh, basically requires the city of Rowlett to pay quarantine leave for firefighters, peace officers, detention officers, and emergency medical technicians or paramedics in our case. Um, if they are, uh, if they acquire COVID-19 specific, the bill is kind of specifically written to that, this one, um, they are not required to use their personal annual leave to do that. So as you know, during the pandemic, um, one of the requirements was that organizations give their employees work up to 14 days. This carries that forward and says that we will continue to pay them. Um, there will be a financial effect to the city and Richard is in the process of, he will have to also rewrite our policies to address this issue. Yeah, but it's specific to government, it's not to private industry. Right. Uh, disease presumption. So in the case that a detention officer, custodial officer, firefighter, peace officer, EMT paramedic is proven to have a virus or disease, in this case COVID-19, um, the government will assume that they were infected at work um, and pay benefits as such if there is a death or a partial disability for any reason. I'd be really curious to debate on that one, why they limited it to EMT, peace officers, firefighters, and custodial officers, because if you're in a disaster, you can have <coughs> works, you're going to have parks guys, you're going to have... Sir? I mean, it's sir? because they don't understand local government at all. I, no, they just like... They hey, man, to brother. <laughs> to do. They just like to tell you what to do. That's I would, I would policy wise, I would hope we as a city would extend that to all of our employees. Matt, I think part one thing, um, it, it may be why it was a focal element. Obviously, during during the pandemic, um, you know, they were obviously on the front lines, but there were other people on the front lines too, like yeah. doctors and nurses and other folks too. What I would uh, say at the state, and I'm, I'm doing this from memory, I think there is a financial benefit that. At least peace officers get if they're killed in the line of duty um, from the state, and the state benefit. And it makes me just wonder if that was the triggering point of why they focus just on um, those, other than just a political answer, which you know happens a lot of times. So, so how long is this one in effect? Forever. Twenty-two. Forever. It's a permit change. Um, because I mean, COVID is going to become a routine illness that's treated with over-the-counter meds. I, I, I don't get this. It's, it's specific to any virus or disease. Um, it's not a virus. Right, for which there is a disaster declaration. What? It is any virus or disease for which there is a disaster declaration. Okay. So if they get okay. malaria, they're always <laughs> But, but it's too for, for COVID because it's not a permanent law. I, I agree, it's a term of permanent law, but it's temporary because of COVID. Um, so this might be one area, and, and this is effective when? I mean, immediately. So this might be one area that we do want to look at some of that ARPA funds, and because there is going to be a cost to this, and allocate some of that $1.2 million to this from those ARPA funds. Because I, I think we need to be really concerned that this is going to affect our general fund budget. Yes. Wasn't this from retroactive to back to March of last year? When it's 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 that that sure. I think this was retro. This <laughs> was <laughs> even if it's, if it's retro, that's even more. I just that's something that we can quantify that we can use those ARPA funds for that um, I think we should consider. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay. Yeah, 
And then just a few more, um, HB 525, and this went through several different renditions, is deals with specifically with religious organizations and our inability when there is a disaster declaration to not have them conducting business and having services. So they are officially now an essential service going forward. Um, that was effective immediately. Public health disaster preparedness. Um, this one may offer us some challenges in a um, disaster declaration. It calls out that we have to check up on citizens that are considered medically fragile. Um, it includes several steps, an automated phone call, a personal phone call, and an in-person visit if they don't respond to either of those two. Um, TIA will set up guidelines for that program and what it looks like, and then our Office of Emergency Management will carry that forward, whether it's help from COAD or it's help from different groups and being able to use our 911 reverse call system to help with this. And then just a fun one, golf cart. Um, now, any master plan community and any road under the speed limit of 35 miles an hour, you can drive your golf cart on. So, um, I know how to make sure that our ordinances are in line with that, um, so that we don't have any issues, but a neighborhood like Waterview, Matt, can now purchase a uh, purchase golf cart and drive around the room. We're actually, I'm sure, using our, our wonderful police force to pull people over golf carts. What's funny is the cops with the golf cart and a little red light. <laughs> so we didn't go to the, Whitney, Blake, and I all attended the TML legislative update. If you have any questions, they've been a huge resource for us to help. Blake may have a few more, it looks like, that he wants to talk about. Yes, just a quick few more. Uh, that was a really good synopsis. <laughs> um, so one of them I, I thought was pretty interesting. I wrote down a note, um, several of these, but one of them, uh, SB 1585, uh, historic landmark. Cities can now designate property as a local historical landmark if the property owner consents or if the Planning and Zoning Commission uh, approves it by three fourths vote. So, I mean, example, Cotton Gin, that was the Coil House, we could designate that now as a local historical landmark. Um, so, that's something I thought was pretty interesting that we can look into in the future. Um, the other thing that's notable is uh, that schools no longer have the ability to do property tax abatements or incentives. That's three thirteen. That's similar to uh, three eighty agreements, right? For municipalities, but now school systems are no longer able to do that because their authorization came out. Yeah. I'm not sure they've historically done it. Hey, you need to get, your, get, get the get the deal. When you, you just say it. I hear you. Yeah. Anybody yeah. with me? Give him the mic. Um, they do when they do bigger uh, incentive projects that would come in from like headquarters stuff. Then, uh, because most of their tax bill is, is made up from school taxes, so that is now going to become a, a big disadvantage for the state by not re upping that. Mm -hmm. Now we expect it to come up in the next legislature to try to renew it. There, there was a time when uh, school districts in the state did more of those. But uh, some years ago, there, there were, and I think it had to do with the School Funding Act at that time, there, there was some significant pushback on city or school districts doing that. And I remember when I first got here, right about that time, there had been, um, there had been a request from the school district to participate in our tourist district, the one that included North Shore. And at that time, they refused on the grounds of the way the School Funding Act was uh, set up. And so I think now what Blake is saying, now they, they won't even have that choice. Um, so another notable one is it's uh, it's now a misdemeanor to uh, have any contact with the chief appraiser of the uh, property tax appraisal district. And so for an elected official, by an elected official, you can't call them. Oh, and I think staff possibly, but I only saw the official. So can't do that, it's illegal. Um, SB 742, uh, businesses can now receive installment payments uh, for property taxes if there is a, uh, a disaster and it has to have fiscal damage. So, um, hmm. um, so Blake, <clears throat> you may not know the answer to this, but uh, as far as the coal house being designated as a um, historical building, if it's been moved, you know, that's been our problem. Uh, 
all along is that we were not able to get the state designation because it had been moved from its original location. Mm -hmm. Do you know if that applies at all to the So states? as part of what was discussed, there was no specifics as to what if, if that if we have to also follow the state's guidelines for how they uh, mark something as a historical landmark. Um, so I mean I, the opinion was that it still had to meet a certain set of guidelines. We could have just gone and made any building we wanted historical. Yeah. It still had to meet. But if the owner isn't interested in doing it, now the city can. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, the established policy. Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing, SB 1438, it repeals an existing law relating to the calculation of the tax rate in a disaster area. Um, so basically, uh, there, we cannot initiate property taxes on uh, in homes that are physically damaged in a designated disaster area. Um, oh, another thing that they're going to have to look at and, and implement with staff. Um, is there are new uh, uh, SB 13 and SB 19 uh, as part of bids? When we do bids, we have to add into our bids that um, the company that we're contracting with cannot at any point boycott uh, the oil industry and cannot boycott firearms. What? So, what did you say? And anything that's over a hundred thousand dollars. Right. Anything that's over a hundred thousand, you can't boycott oil industry, you cannot boycott arms, and you cannot yeah. The other thing to listen to, the other thing is you cannot contract with a company that is in Iran, China, Russia, uh, basically adversary countries of the United States of America. So that's a new building as well. Um, there's a new program that you and I may have to look into, uh, SB 941, the Scenic Byways Program. Uh, TxDOT established, uh, is, is tasked with establishing a Scenic Byways Program in which the city can apply for grants for federal funding, provided that um, the highway is designated under a certain state law as prohibited from having commercial signage and may be designated as a scenic state byway. So that may open us up to more opportunities. I'll look at SB, SB 941. Uh, that's all I have. Do you have anything, Wendy? Uh, SB, or I'm sorry, House Bill HB 1869, redefine debt for debt financing. I don't know that it'll have an adverse effect on us, but there's a new definition of what you can consider debt for I for INS yeah. um, that starts September 1st of this year. That's, the, um, um, that, that's relating to uh, what we're allowed to uh, fund through CO bonds. So we can't, can't fund the city hall or a community center through a CO bond, that's VGM. So there's specific items in here of what you can do. There was a bill that I was carrying for a little while and I lost it about dealing with um, camping in public spaces. That, that that was, it did. So now we're discussing this for me. Right. There's no camping in public. And this, if, if, you, if the city wanted to have an area where that's allowed, you would have to designate that area as a camping ground. That was specifically to address homelessness. Yes. And, yes. Now, and now it makes it classy if you are camping in public property. Yeah, it's a class D. That's effective. That's the, the I mean, that's effective um, in a few months because they were giving Austin and Dallas some time to transition and have a policy to initiate. Because if it was immediately, that would have just been impossible to get. Yeah, right. I mean, because of the way, we have some pretty good camping ordinances in Dallas. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. We do. So that helps us for sure. It just, gives, it, I mean, it just gives a little bit more team. You know, the DA still has to prosecute the case, you're still going to address some problems that let you go, but it, it at least lets you track a little bit better and it's a little bit more teeth than to being able to help with moving homeless. Yeah. Another important one uh, is Senate Bill 1438, which is redoes the, the tax rate calculation for disaster areas. So, as we thought before, uh, they repealed the existing law relating to the calculation of tax rate in a disaster. 
which means that when we chose uh, to change the maximum tax rate at eight percent before the rollback last year, they've they've done away with that for any type of pandemic. Yeah. So you're not for the future. Doesn't change the future. No, we're fine now, uh, for what we had before, but it, that definitely. That's one of the reasons it did not make the top of the list because it doesn't really affect us from the past. Yeah. But it's good to know. Yeah. Just yeah, it's just something good to know. Uh, so did they pass a budget? <laughs> yes, they passed. How much did they get this time? HB one passed. Uh, <laughs> how much? How much? What percentage was it higher? Uh, probably over eight percent. Oh, oh sure. <laughs> I mean, two years, two years ago. What is that point? Yeah. Point? Yeah. I guarantee it's way over two percent. Yeah. 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 Two years ago. <laughs> the governor had like six priorities or nine priorities. Do you remember? And the lieutenant governor had thirty. Oh my God. Those are those are right? And when they send these bills to committee for debate, it does not mean that you have people talking about them intelligently. Uh, SB eight or four uh, is a tourism hit bill, which removes the require the old requirement for the legislature to approve the city before they have to do that. So now city council can do that on their own as long as they meet three or four conditions of uh, the hotel. So we'd be able to do that. For so so we don't have to go back to the legislature. We don't have to go back to the legislature to do that. That's, oh, awesome. that's good news. That's really good news. So that's, that's a SB 804. Yeah. Yeah. That makes so much sense. I can't believe we have to go to the So that'll be good. Exactly. As soon as we have two hotels, then we can yeah. boom. There you go. With that place. Um, I think that's about all the major ones. Camping. The camping was HP 1925. Okay. Thank you. Oh, can't. Uh, no obstructing the highway. Uh, it's a felony. Unless you're in the uh, one that will, will affect uh, mm. the budget a little bit is SB 790, which is the ambulance bill, balance billing. Um, so you can't you can't bill for a balance after insurance pays for it. Yeah. Oh, that's going to affect us. Probably. So we we bill for ambulance services. Right. If we bill the insurance company, we have to accept what the insurance company pays on it and not bill the customer for the balance. I don't think we've been doing that anyway. No, we, well, we, we, we send them a payment, like you have to pay this, but we're never going to really. Yeah. I mean, I got billed for various ambulance, but. Um, yeah. Well, it was really, it was really. We can't um, even take it. We can't find a win on it. It was really pointed toward like air ambulance what? because the pair toward of helicopter. Because their bill is over ten thousand yeah. dollars, and insurance would come in only pay a thousand for it, and then he's supposed to be on the hook for thousands of dollars. But private EMS could have followed up. I don't think we're probably doing that, though. Y'all do? You? No, we're not. I think we bill it once in the draw. Yeah. So, and that's it. That's uh, that's all the notes that I had. It covered the rest. So. There's camping on public property right there, by the way. Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> they do have a tent. Do they have a tent? I don't know. They have a tent now. They have a tent. It's a grill. 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 But yeah, the, the funniest bill was the chicken bill. Yeah. No, chicken bill. There was chicken rabbits. Do you sell chicken? The chicken rabbits. All right. Well, our our ordinance is two. Two. Without. I think the state ordinance is six. No roosters. No, no roosters. No, no roosters. So, I was going to say, if my neighbor gets a rooster, I'm taking a rooster to Abbott's. So, Brian, can I talk about the GISD thing now or no? Yes, Mayor. I have it on my uh, tag to do next. I was just waiting for everybody. <laughs> okay. Are y'all are y'all done with legislative update? I guess we'll have this on the agenda again in the near future after the special sessions. Yeah. Sure. Hey, you know what, Brian? Let's 
Thank I'll you, send Mom. you their wrap-up presentation and also their summary of those. It's an 80-page summary of all the bills from TML. And then you send that out to all the council. And you guys can take a look at it. Arguably 80 pages in the summary. <laughs> That's pretty incredible. And, and the big thing was this legislative session didn't do as much as the last one did. The last one had almost 8,000 bills. So. Okay. All right, yes, Mayor. Yeah. Please. Okay, so um, Robert Selders, who is the um, president of the GISD Board of Trustees, I don't know if they've had a new election yet or not. Um, he was last year. They did have a new election? No, not for that. Okay, and yeah, they had an election for the Board of Trustees. Um, I don't know if he's still president, is my point. Anyway, he approached me and um, wanted to uh, build a coalition between the uh, Garland Independent School District and the three cities it serves as far as the city leadership goes. And you've got that email um, and that proposed revolution, the revolution. <laughs> <laughs> resolution. Um, there's no really prepared, um, you know, uh, list of you know priorities or anything it's just a you know let's build this coalition let's figure out how we can improve our working relationship together um, and I think it's a great idea um, the the uh, resolution that's been proposed um, you also had a copy of that uh, I'm just going to go over briefly create a strong coalition with the uh, district and the three cities open communication and collaboration between all parties, um, collaborate, um, let's see, ongoing communication, joint planning, um, foster relationships, share, sharing vision and have a shared vision, um, work together to overcome challenges of you know, learning, uh, learning issues for students, and the last whereas on the first page uh, is proposing the mayors of each city plus one additional city government representative as designated by each mayor. Now we make those decisions as a group. Um, and then the city manager or uh, their designee and then the GISD board of trustees president, the chair of the district affairs committee um, and the GISD superintendent as people that are on the actual coalition. Um, and then another uh, objective is to serve as ambassador, ambassadors and advocates for the district. So I will stop there, see what people's thoughts are, and see what questions you have or any concerns you have about the current resolution. I think it's a great idea. I think uh, that the school system should have reached out for a lot more joint operations like this a lot sooner, but I'm glad that they've done it now and that we can move forward with that. That sounds good. <laughs> Is this a thumbs up, thumbs down situation? Yes. Well, I, just, I will give an editorial comment along the lines of what, what Whitney said is, you know, hey, better late than never. Uh, I think it's a good start, but, you know, they haven't always been the best partner, and if this is what it takes for them to start being a better partner, then definitely all for it. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. What immediately comes to mind for me <laughs> is, uh, the Environmental Learning Center that we're working on, uh, one of the things that we need to partner with the school district on is parking. Uh, and there's two schools uh, that are adjacent to that property, and uh, there's lots of parking uh, in those school parking lots. And, um, you know, I have talked to the school board over the years uh, of partnering with them. And, um, and, you know, in previous years, we had talked about some uh, financial investment from the school district in this because it is actually a great asset uh, for the district and something that they don't have in the district uh, is an environmental learning center. So anyway, just for that project alone, uh, I would be excited to have this kind of partnership and collaboration with the district. 
Well, I think it's a great idea because I am a sub in the schools and I see what's going on. And I would sometimes just have, I let them know what I do, that I'm a city council person. And you would be surprised how receptive, especially in the high schools, they, they won't listen. They won't learn what's going on. So, and that's how I told them about you, Blake. <laughs> and they were really excited to hear of an 18 year old being on the city council. I mean, they were super excited. So, I think it's 22. It's 22. Yeah. It's like, no, when you were 18, I told him he was first year later, he was 18. They went, Whoa. And then when it is, one of them said, I went to college elementary school with him. I said, you did? I said, I thought it was, I thought it was your home school. I said, you did? So anyway, great idea. Better life than ever. Thank you. Brian? Mayor, I, I like the idea. There, there's been issues over the years that we've We've uh, tried to push. Um, there's another project out in the North Shore, you know, that we have an interest for economic development purposes. And so I think this elevates that conversation and kind of institutionalizes to make sure that we get to have it. So um, I absolutely am in favor of it. Can I get the microphone back? Sorry. They're all down here now. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> So this is very much worded one way in regards to, you know, working collaboratively, working together, um, you know, for the good of the school district. I think we need to put some wording in here that is uh, uh, bifurcating that both directions. That's, the, that's not the right use of that word. I put it in there. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, it talks about serve as ambassadors and advocates to the district initiatives, priorities, and accomplishments. I think we need to put something in here about, you know, uh, working together to serve for the good of the communities also. So, Mayor, I, very good point. Um, I'm on that uh, community and um, hospital advisory board for uh, Lake Point, and it does tend to be one-sided sometimes, and so, I mean, it's, it's great. We get to learn a lot about what's going on with the hospital, but there's also things that we want to make sure our community is being taken care of. And so I think you're absolutely right, Mayor. We, we, that would be a small area we can push back, but I think it's appropriate. Yeah, so I'm going to have a, a call um, with Robert this next week, and they want to develop it. They want us to approve this resolution, which they've already approved at the GISD level. Um, which, you know, I think it needs to be revised to have that uh, bi-directional uh, statement in there. Then they also want to develop a memorandum, memorandum of understanding, and we can certainly make sure our interests are considered uh, more succinctly in that memorandum of understanding, too. Um, so I'll uh, get with him, and then um, we'll, try, we'll try to put this on a consent agenda for an upcoming meeting. Is that okay? Okay. Thanks. And, and which of you elected officials would like to be that second person? Let me say one something. hand raised. Let me say two something. hand raised. Could I say something real quick? Yeah. yeah. Uh, hey, you got to have the microphone. Blank works with the youth council, so that's kind of interesting. I understand the KRB thing, but. I don't, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if this is a concern or what. It's just. It rings in my head when I read this. Um, is this a result of the failure of their bond? <laughs> Do they want help from the cities to promote that? Is, is that what this is? You know, I don't know. know. I, I, I'd like to not be so all like about that. We don't even want to go there. I, I will tell you this, that um, I have this little list in my binder of what I wanted to accomplish while I was mayor, and one of them was this kind of a relationship. Um, and um, so I'm glad to see it, even if it is not yeah. in the purest. It's, it's, it's about time, but I'm wondering if that's the whole basis. I don't know. Do you want me to ask him that? But I think that we'll have a you know detailed conversation with him about you know this looks a little bit one-sided to 
the cities to support the schools, and, and we have felt uh, you know a little bit lacking on the other side, and we need to strengthen this in that regard. Yes, it should be working yeah. both ways. Yeah. Absolutely should. Should be working both ways. And really, I mean, you you made a good point, Mayo, about uh, the work with the Youth Advisory Council because I think it's really important to encourage. Uh, the kids that are coming up mm -hmm. through the district to be involved in our community, but also to, to stay here uh, and to invest in our community. So, um, you know, I feel I feel really blessed. I, they've been very open to um, having conversations with me specifically about the Environmental Learning Center. So I feel like when I said I'll have my time, you know, I, I believe that, that I would have opportunities to speak to that. Yes, but, um, and we'll carry your manner too. Yeah, yeah of course, but, but, from, but from a larger uh, perspective, I, I think working with the, um, with the Youth Advisory Council and strengthening that mm -hmm. and pulling the leadership and developing those relationships is really key. I wonder if uh, another suggestion I can make to, to Robert is, you know, because Garland has a Youth Advisory Council, you know, maybe we have one student from each, I don't even know if Saxe has one, you know, we include one student from those advisory councils um, as part of, you know, maybe they're just, uh, they're not a voting member, but they're, yeah. you know. I, I would, I, that's one of the things I was going to say too, is I'd like to see that, I'd like to see that involvement uh, from, from the, the chair of the Youth Advisory Council, um, because I mean, ultimately this, this affects them more than it affects me or anybody else here, because they're the ones that are playing. Um, so yes, I would like to see that suggestion uh, to them, because I think that would uh, even even more benefit their purpose of this. Yeah. Um, All right. So, as you guys know, we have been ahead of schedule, so we promised to get y'all out of here by five today. So uh, let's see how close we can get to that. So we have a couple of wrap-up things uh, we want to do. Uh, one, um, I'm, uh, well, actually, excuse me, I just remember we let's take one quick five-minute break because there's a couple of things I want to put up here uh, from our other list, and then we will do our wrap-up and stuff. So, all right, cameras on. So we're going to go ahead and get started um, in uh, our uh, final. Uh, discussions. So uh, Robert is uh, putting together that one uh, slide that kind of shows where we think our resources are versus what uh, some of the big ticket items are for this year. Remember, you know, we're not asking council to make a specific decision like we want that pickup truck bought or you know we want this done. But we're this is more the strategy type of issues. But you know, you've seen the, the big numbers. And so as we, as we kind of discuss this out, part of this is, it's kind of like what the mayor was doing a while ago on the ARPA funds. You know, there were some things that were hot topic items, like supporting the generators for the sewer lift station. So we did call, call that out, but mostly it was like, uh, are we okay with the proposed broadband projects as a whole and some of the other expenses? And then, and then saying that we would use the rest of it for water and sewer projects, um, of which we identified at least a couple of the water and sewer projects. So today what I want to do is, is similar to, uh, to that, is you know, we, we, have, uh, we have several buckets of money, some of which have to be or needs to be restricted to one time. And, um, you know, and, and then um, quite a bit that can be used for ongoing. So what we want to do is to hear from council, what, where is your pain point? You know, in terms of a threshold, you know, you know, for example, if we say that, you know, uh, you know, if we, if we come back, this is, this is one way I would think of it. If we came back and said, you know, uh, there were 12 positions asked for, and, uh, you know, we want to support, you know, uh, you know, in the actual city manager's proposed budget, We've got six of those in there, and there were three vehicles we needed to buy. I might try to use the one-time funds to buy the vehicles. I think they can't go through the enterprise program, but if they could, that would be fine. And um, and then use the ongoing funds for that. Or, uh, you know, if we if we like, for example, that PCI uh, program, 
and, and Gary didn't say this right yesterday. I just want to bring it back, back to that. They spent seven months to do a quarter of the city, quadrant. So that is 28 months, almost three years, to do the entire city versus two weeks. There's a huge value, even though it's a big ticket item, it's a huge value of having the entire city done in a much more thorough manner because they're using, although they have their techniques, they're still using a lot of judgment versus the software, which would be more objective. So, so if there's anything that's on your hot button item that, Brian, we have to do this or we have to do that, and then how we carve the rest of it out, that's what I really want to hear today. So, uh, are we almost there? Almost there. We're, gonna, uh, we're almost there. And then while we're, while we're waiting for that, um, and maybe this is on your list, I, you know, it's a little hard with these requests to know what's in that equipment 530 and this other 840. So, um, can you talk to that? Yeah, what was it again, Mayor? Which one? On the request side, I understand the employee pay midpoint, I understand oh, yes. the additional staff. The equipment of 530 and the other of 840, is that everything that was on all departments list? Oh, is that? Yes. Okay, yeah, give me one second here. And yes, it is, Mayor. If you go, if you look in the, the big book notebook we sent you earlier this week, the, um, page nine is a salmon color or peach color uh, document. That's the entire uh, thing. And although Robert kind of wrote some of it out as to how much is equipment and whatever, it's it's about uh, it's over three million dollars worth of request, and that is the entire list of this year, with the exception of pay, which we kind of do more corporately, globally, which is uh, which we discussed uh, yesterday morning. This is the department-specific list of people, equipment. Programs, increased cost, uh, increased cost above and beyond uh, just normal uh, contract increases. Uh, it's that list right here, and I see most of you, you all have that pulled up. So, um, two, six, seven, nine. so if I take the 1.3, the 530, the 840, that's 2.670. And you're saying that equates to page nine two six seven nine, yes, is, but it excludes the other it items down. Rounding. Right, but it excludes the other items down below. Um, no, it does not. Uh, this summary total did not include the like utility fund or any of those. This is all general fund stuff. Okay, on that's this, this summary same. list here. That's not what I'm asking. Okay. When you go to page nine, it comes down to two, six, seven, nine, and then there's four items underneath that. Yes. Those aren't utility fund items. Uh, two of them are. Where? One of them. Uh, one of them is inspection fee fund. What's that? One is inspection fee fund, one's utility billing, and then two are CIP. Yes. The facilities. Okay. So okay. There, there, there are four separate funds, or three separate funds inspection fee fund, uh, utility billing, or utility fund. And then two that would be out of CIP, which would and could affect the general fund. The transfer. Okay, I'm just trying to understand why those are excluded. I understand the utility fund being excluded, but yeah, what would happen is on the public works, the CIP ones, is that uh, if we did not identify a one-time source of funds, we would have to increase the transfer for one year to do those projects. Okay. So, so technically, Mayor, we really have. The two million six seventy nine plus one hundred forty five thousand in uh, projects that would affect the general fund. All right, but on this green red page, so let me ask it this way: So we just had two days of presentations from department heads. Does this list on page nine, and therefore this red up here, pretty much entail the requests that we heard over the last two days? Yes, and. Um, this list would not include the utility fund projects, right. but yes, for everything else. Okay. All right. Yeah. 
So what we asked um, staff to do was to add the uh, employee pay at the midpoint as a starting point for the discussion. Um, we have 13.75 general fund employees. Remember, there's another one in the utility billing. Um, so that's a total of 1.3. Um, there's equipment, and some of that equipment would be related to that, or do we have the people? Is that personnel on the call, or is that? Okay. Okay. So if there's a vehicle, sorry. Robert, we're trying to pull your big one up. Did you update it on the share drive? Yes, ma'am. It is called uh, Resources Requests 2. Oh, here it is. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, ma'am. That's different. It's that one. It's that one there. Yeah, so we were trying to get to be able to summarize all the needs that have been identified so that we can kind of start crafting some sort of how we're going to get there um, uh, discussion. So, based on the earlier conversation today, we have added in the, um, the CARES funding, the amount that is left in CARES, $1.5 uh, the 1.5 million uh, includes a small amount that is left in the business development piece. Um, there's a portion uh, that we have not yet spent um, in the uh, individual systems. And then there is uh, some leftover funds, including the $750,000 clawback. So that's why we came up with the 1.5 million. And um, we went ahead and put the land up here but only to ask her again to, to, to let y'all know, know that that is uh, still available and we have not specifically identified what to do with that. You had a discussion about that earlier, so it's just on the list, just, just so we can say. So we have about $1.2 million available for ongoing expenses, and we have, um, wait a minute, did we end up with a typo? Um, I think your council discussion was a million, not not a hundred thousand. Oh, it was yeah. a million originally, and I think sorry, it it's, yeah, it's a million, not one hundred thousand on the top of the left. Yeah. Wow, we're short. And then that will probably change your total by nine hundred thousand. Uh, where's it? Do we have the, the one that was just a pick? I don't think we do, I don't know if we print it down. You say it under a new name again? What's that? So the other is a whole bunch of stuff on here that is not necessarily people or um, or uh, equipment. So the service, the, the hundred thousand plus for uh, to do the PCI update would be another. Other. The um, let's see, the AC maintenance would be under other. The capital fuel system, now that might be under equipment. GIS training, some of the additional training dollars. Stuff that wasn't on the other that's going to now get covered under the other on this sheet, we're going to get taken off that that wasn't included in those numbers. Well, yeah, but, but again, uh, you know, we're not trying to craft the, the final proposed budget. What we're trying to do is where, where are those pain points, where are the hot buttons that, you know, th this is where I'm getting feedback from you to make sure we don't miss the boat when I submit it in August and then everybody goes, this isn't near the one we talked about. The equipment on the right can be one time. The other is probably recurring. Is that a fair statement? So, Mayor, um, remember, 140000 of that other for the PCI is not ongoing. That would be repeated every four years. Um, so um, that would be a one time. Your equipment should be treated as one time. But the rest of other? Most of the rest of others will be ongoing. You're so, right. can you guys split other between ongoing and one time? Yeah, we can. We can we and if you need to do it later, that's fine. I just yeah, think it's important. Yeah. 
Yeah, we can do that there. So y'all chose to put the, the highest level of pay raise on this right side of the ledger. Um, you told me you weren't going to do that to us, and then you did it. <laughs> well, only for this, and we can change it. But but the, but the reason is that has been our philosophy in prior years. But we were careful not to say recommendation A, B, C. Their options A, B, C. And it says requests. So <laughs> change that to options. <laughs> it was not intentional. Yeah, I, and I don't think Matt was in the room when we had the presentation on this. The the one thing you know. I'll preface this with, it's very, very, very important to not only, um, you know, get the, the staffing we need, but it's also important to reward the current staff that we have. It's hard, hard uh, uh, decision to make when you have to give, you know, give one at the expense of another. Um, the one thing I wanted to say again is, you know, this very good market analysis and it showed three different options. And pretty much when you look at the three different options, regardless of which one we take, it keeps us in the same general order of, of pay in relationship to our neighboring communities, whether we, we pick option one, two, or three. Um, so I think that's an important point to keep in mind. Um, it's not like if we pick option one, we're number two on the list, and if we pick option two, we're number 18 on the list. We, we stay right where, um, in the middle, regardless of which option we pick, for the most part. And yeah, Mayor, you're right. Um, I will add one little nuance to it, is that this information is always one years old, because um, at the time that we do the survey, these, the, these other cities have already adopted their budget. So when we implement it, we're implementing it for next year, means that we will always be one year behind the other cities. And those cities are also going to be doing raises this year. And so um, that's why it's important for us to keep. But you know what? It's always going to be static. It's always going to be that. It, it, it would always be static at that point. But I just, that's a little new. And I just want to make sure. Right, but the, the other cities are doing the same thing. They yes. have the same situation, too. Yes, exactly. I mean, you, it's not a perfect world. No, it's not. All right, so are you done, Robert? No, Mary. He's working on the split right now. Oh, okay. Well, that's cool. So you uh, want to talk about PBB while he's working on that? We can, Mary. One thing I was going to point out on the uh, one time the surplus to 500000 um, this is a little bit less than um, what we actually think we're going to hit the year end. You may remember from the last time we had that discussion. But, you know, we still have to find some place that we're going to pay that extra electric bill, that $388,000 electric bill. Yeah. Well, I, I, know, but it's, I know, but it's still going to have to be paid. Yep. And it has to do with uh, that winter storm and all the cities have gotten such a, such a bill. Don't pay the elected officials. <laughs> that's good. Be that's good. Totally that. I mean, what is it, $5 for you guys? So we'll be totally the budget for that. How about we be totally the governor's budget? Yeah. yeah. Can we do that? That'd be nice. Rough All right, can you talk about PPV? Sure, we can do that while we're knowing this. <clears throat> Let's see. All right. So, as a part, that. so as a part of what we uh, have been working on this year in terms of implementing priority-based budgeting, um, as you as you know, it's you know our goal was uh, to be able to have a different level of conversation with council about how our budgets are allocated. When you do it fund by fund or even department by department. It doesn't give you enough clarity to know where we're actually allocating our dollars to. So the goal was to be able to, to create, um, you know, programs in such a way that we could um, see how those programs were aligned against our top priorities. So 
there was a ranking um, that we did a couple of years ago when we first got into this. Um, you'll remember that there are um, multiple criteria that we use. There's the four core criteria, things like is it a state or federal mandate, um, things like you know, how much revenue recovery. So if it's 100% funded, then you would get the max score. If it's 50% funded, you might get only half that score. Um, uh, community demand, um, so is, it, is that demand increasing or decreasing? And then we had our seven strategic priorities. And so then we ranked it against that. So no one program can get a perfect score. It's not possible. So for example, you may have a specific police program that's mandated and maybe even cost effective, but, um, but it may not affect neighborhood quality or may not affect um, you know, um, uh, culture and leisure. So that's, that's one thing. So that's why there's no perfect uh, score on any particular project because each one of them are clinically evaluated against other um, against the the, the what would be eleven core cri or the eleven criteria. So where we where we ended up at, you know that that assignment was done a couple years ago, and then this past year there were times that you know we still felt like something wasn't quite right, and we spent more time on it. And so just, just the challenge I think you, know, you would have as long, along with any of us is that at most, when we went back through it the second time and reevaluated some of that, at most there was maybe a one or two um, number change. And so it really doesn't change the ranking that much. It, you know, the, the number of programs that would have gone from a, a three to a two or a four to a three or a drop uh, to, a, to a different level were very, very small. And then on top of that, you know, we, we went back through it this past year just, uh, just to make sure that we were including things like how many customers are affected. Um, you know, what are the metrics we're measuring against for success? And so all of this comes into play when you're trying to figure out, you know, how do you get your hands around such a, a big, a hundred plus million dollar budget. So one thing that we did this year is we went through an exercise to figure out, one, how to squeeze the budget because we knew there's dollars left on, and if you look at these programs, you're not spending all of the dollars that we have allocated based on the budget. So we went back through an exercise I mentioned one to you yesterday, like on um, our uh, Boeing contract, that we consistently have about forty or fifty thousand dollars left over. Um, and remember, some of that budget is because of rainfall, so um, so it's weather weather dependent too. But but we're not spending it, and so those monies can be reallocated. You know, maybe it's Highway 66 median management, maybe it's you know some other um, program or cost. So we go going. Um, so in going through, I need visual reference here. But so in going through this this exercise, we identified about three hundred fifty thousand dollars that we feel like needs to be uh, that we can reduce the budget for, or um, find other sources in, in one particular one, find other sources to help pay for it. So that was step one. The second thing we did is we went back and evaluated evaluated the uh, evaluated PDB programs that we felt like needed um, or could use additional analysis. And it's for a couple reasons. You know, for our fleet system this year, we ended up uh, you know going with Enterprise, which we think is going to save us money over time. Not to mention have better, uh, better equipment, more up to date equipment. We think that, for example, and this will be if you go back to this page here. It's in pink, pink and white. Um, these were about, about a dozen items we identified that we think that we need more conversation about. So, Blake, you mentioned this morning you asked about GED. So, I'm going to give you a little maybe a different perspective on this question. So a number of years ago, um, you know, I asked our library, you know, how successful is our GED program? 
And at that time, they said, well, we had 20 people sign up last year. Now, remember, this is six, seven years ago, okay? But still, you see that the numbers are still relatively the same in years that we've had only just a couple. And so we said, okay, so we're spending 15000 That was the direct cost at that time. We didn't have a GD coordinator. Uh, this was the direct cost for materials and supplies and things like that. So um, they said, okay, we had 20. I said, okay, well, so, so what, was, you know, what was your success ratio? Well, 18 passed the class. So it was a little test they take and think, okay, that's great. So then the question came down to how many passed the GED? Two people. So we were actually spending $7,500 per person who actually successfully passed the GED. And remember, passing the GED is what changes your life. That's where you're going to earn 20% more income over the course of your lifetime. So, um, so at that point, the question was, what do we do to, uh, to identify people who may need English as a second language first, who may need private tutoring or personal tutoring before they even go through the GED program. Um, and so from that, there were modifications made, but, but to be honest, we're still having a very few amount of people actually passing the GED, and now we have a GED coordinator as well. So in our mind, this, this is the performance issue. Is this a program we need to spend more time on to figure out if there's a better way? Maybe it's partnering with the local college. You know, maybe their passing ratio is higher than ours because they do stuff that we don't do. Now, I think the personal touch, Laura is absolutely right about, because, you know, that, that personal tutoring and stuff like that, I think, you know, does make a difference. But I think that that's a program we identify we want to spend more time on. Household hazardous waste is another one. Because, as Martha mentioned yesterday, you know, we learned something really important this week that latex paint is not household hazardous waste. And so we know from, um, from the way that the program is growing that, that our cost will increase about $20,000 next year if we don't change anything about household hazardous waste. We think that there's got to be some better solution. Maybe it's more community education. Um, you know, as Martha mentioned, maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe it's not really a renegotiation of the contract because um, the contract is the same for all the cities that participate, but there may be some other things that we do, or maybe it is that we eliminate it. We don't want to eliminate it, because if you don't have an alternative like that, people are just going to put it in the trash. It's going to be in the garbage, and then you know, they, that the, uh, you know, the our, our vendor may or may not notice. Um, the arts program, I would elevate that maybe to a more of a policy level discussion. You know, or do we want to continue to contribute forty thousand dollars a year? Is that something that we don't want to do anymore? So, so my only point with with all of this is that each one of these really was was identified for a different reason for us to have this discussion. Um, you know, and to say that, uh, like I'll give you one last one: uh, custodial services, similar to what we did with Fleet, when we had this conversation with Enterprise. We made a value judgment about you know, whether or not we would, say, contract that, the, the, the maintenance out. And one of the reasons we decided not to at that time is that we felt like we were still going to need a robust maintenance program for the yellow iron and the, 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 the trucks and vehicles that were not in the enterprise program. And, but with custodial services, you look at all the things that we have, um, you know, would it be more efficient for a company to come in with a very regimented um, list of tasks and go into each building and they do X amount of work? This is this is this happens all over the country. Pretty much every private business does this. Um, and if we did, there still may be a need for you know permanent staff, like say at the RCC, where you've got to clean that shower or that bath bathroom um, several times during the day. But we don't know that until we actually go through that out that outsourcing exercise. So, so the point I wanted to make is, and, and I was, we were thinking that maybe you guys might have some other uh, uh, programs that you might have identified as impossible for discussion. But this is where we're at with this because we think there's more work that we can do with this. 
And we we did do one thing, and I don't remember. Did you ever finish? Yeah. Did you have that slide in the SharePoint yet? The one with the circle. All right, we're going to pull up um, the, this one slide. I want to just kind of show you what I'm getting at. Um, <clears throat> no, it's not. It's, it's the one with the circle, the, the graph that you did. The graph on PPD. Oh. Did you put that one in there yet? I did. It's expenditures by priority. What's it called, Robert? Expenditures by priority. Oh, that's why you didn't know when I asked about the circle. Okay. All right. By quartile, is that what you mean? By priority? Yes, it's, it's done by quartile. Okay. Okay. So, council, you'll remember that as we, with the ranking, uh, based on the scores, they're broken down into four quadrant, uh, quadrants or quartiles. And so you can see quartile one is going to be the highest in terms of the dollars, simply because um, it's all your, your public safety, police and fire, a lot of your public work stuff um, that have the higher scores, the scores in the 60s and 70s. Um, and those kind of things. And then as you get through into each other quartile, you can see how the numbers drop until we have about $5 million in quarter four. What we didn't feel like the answer was, was um, is, you know, when we went through this initial exercise and talking to other cities and seeing how they do it, as well as with the, um, the, the consultant that helped us build this program, was that, you know, uh, very few cities have tried to just take a straight line and say, we want to reallocate everything in Quart uh, Quartel 4. And the ones that did, they, they said it took them several years to do that, and it took time to be able to do it. Because based on the ranking, what happens is, this is your library. This is, this is the RCC. So when you start looking at those all the different criteria, a lot of the uh, quality of life programs are in that, that section. So what we thought and what we spent time on was identifying specific programs that we need to spend more time on as opposed to whether it was in quartile four or three. Now we started there because that was a great starting point, but that's why we have identified these groupings that you see, these dozen programs um, that's where we identified those at. So, and I saw we had our other thing ready to go up too. But, um, but did you guys, in going through the book, and I know y'all didn't have much time with it, were there any other programs? I know you asked Blake about GED, and, um, and I don't remember who asked about it. Um, there was one of the others. But is there anything else that you guys saw in there that you would think that we probably should spend more time on? This in this book. I think you've made a good point about the custodial services. Um, I, I would love to see a comparison of what it would cost us to have um, a vendor come in and do that, um, understanding that we're going to have to have, you know, a certain level of uh, staff that are custodial services. But as far as just the weekly or bi-weekly service to some of our buildings, um, I, I think that would be a good exercise to go through. Yeah. Yeah, I agree too. Right. The one I saw that uh, seemed to be fairly cheap too was the uh, deep cleaning of the dispatch center mm -hmm. at the police station. Well, one thing I, I didn't say yesterday, remember, you're hearing everything they asked for. To me, that's what I want to do before this year's end. I want to do that this summer. Yeah. I want to knock that thing. Yeah, it's not going to be a budget item for next year. Yeah. Yes, That's adding to, not subtracting from, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, I was, I was kind of surprised to see um, VIPs with a, a score, a quartile four, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, in, unless, unless the program has changed, I mean, they save a lot of money uh, and time for officers doing the 
full changes, doing a lot of the things that um, that frees up our officers. So understand that from a value judgment, we love VIMS. I mean, we absolutely love them, and we think it's a robust program, and it's a part of that volunteer effort that we're so proud of. You know, so the question may be that, that is, we're spending resources to manage. You know, one thing that, that I think is important to acknowledge is that you have overhead in this too now. And before, when somebody said, well, how much does it cost us to put on the downtown program? We would have told you what we were spending out of the hotel, motel money and the general fund money, but not how much time it really is taking us. There's a value to all that too. And so to your, to your point, you know, we think that, you know, that may be an area for us to look at. Is it possible to have somebody that volunteers to do that, that supervision and maybe cut some of that and reallocate some of their time? Well, I mean, it's, it's a poor job for but I certainly wouldn't want to cut that program. No. I think maybe it would help if you explained again how it, the scoring is done as far as why it falls in a certain quartile and it's the alignment. Well, I just did that. We did. We understand. Okay, that. I just want to make sure. We understand. I was over there. Oh, okay. That's <laughs> So, I just want to make sure. There's no perfect way to score it. Right. You know. And and that was it was one of those where when we saw some of the programs it was kind of like oh wow but it, it's just all with the you know alignment of the strategic plan. Okay. I think Blake, I think I saw you pointing at this a couple times. Yes, this is the list of all the programs uh, that we have in the city by quartile. And so if we were, you know, I know we had gave you the book where you can see the details, but if you were trying to look for a, a quick uh, summary of this, this is where you would find it. Right. Well, you know. I don't know that you want to end with my comments, so okay. let me go first. <laughs> um, so I, I, am, I am not thinking the PBB process was what I was expecting by any means. Um, PBB budgeting should be about looking at programs and seeing what programs you, you discontinue or se severely curtail. Um, that you don't, you know, that you have higher priorities in a city. When I look at this uh, list that adds up to the um, $340,000, this is no, no, no more than line item budgeting and figuring out where our budget is inflated versus our actual costs. This is not PDB budgeting. So I'm very frustrated. Well, what, what, I would, what I would add though, Mayor, is that whereas the exercise may have started there, it affects every program in the city. On top of that, we've identified programs that I think are absolutely doing what you think is, maybe we curtail them, maybe we contract them out, maybe we um, outsource it, maybe we, you know, that. that we haven't, we're not there, and that's not the proposal on the budget. No, you, look at the, you look at the summary page, and then, what it is, is line item budgeting where we have over budgeted compared to actual. That's what the $340,000 in savings is. So I don't think we're anywhere where we need to be in PPP budgeting. Um, my other concern is this to me looks like a finance initiative, not a department head initiative on PPP budgeting. Um, so that's my other frustration. So, um, how did we get to these number the reductions? Because they're all even, or you know, they're all um, numbers are similar to each other. When you go down, was it just did you tell each department, hey, uh, reduce your budget by five percent? And so, what what we did was we we did not give them a target, um, and we have in years past when you know when the economy is tanking and we really do need to cut. Right. We're usually done it on a target basis. What we challenged them was instead was to go back and to look at their budget and find areas where we're just not spending the money. And every department participated in this process to say, you know, these are things that we're not doing. The reason that you're seeing some of the same numbers is that, it, let's say it was a, uh, you know, an easy one is the Boeing because it is one contract within one program. But in, but in some respect, some of those expenses affect multiple programs, such as a person. Not, you know, it's, it's not often that one person is assigned one program. The crisis intervention is one where we have two now. But in some other cases, 
Um, you know, you may have an individual who is split over three, four, five, six programs. And so if we were to uh, lower a uh, consulting services contract or to eliminate a, uh, an expense, it may have affected multiple ones. And I think what we did, this is the part of the accounting exercise part, we, would, we may have done an even allocation of those expenses. But. Um, thank you for that explanation. So uh, just, so like, okay, emergency dispatch, uh, there's a reduction, program reduction of 35.29. So in reality, that would have been 45.29 minus their, or, I mean, because there's a request to add more funding Dispatch. So is that already taken into account? So, so part of going back to what I said yesterday, think about it from this perspective. So, you know, at the point when you know we get through the uh, the presentations from staff in May, and then we start, uh, we get our first real preliminary property tax uh, analysis at the end of May. Um, that's when we started to be able to look at it. Oh, how close are we going to be to hit the mark? How far away? What do we need to do? That's when we directed staff to go back to the drawing board and to figure out where they're not spending those dollars and where we can reallocate those to. So that was a part of an initial exercise. What we're trying to say is that there's more work to be done, um, some of which we may be able to finish in July and some of which will take a little bit longer. Um, I'll just add one last thing. Um, you know, I'm just I'm a little nervous with um, decreasing, you know, by 340, and I don't necessarily know exactly what we're reducing um, within this. I mean, I know it's, you know, it's all of this stuff. Or understanding. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, just. All right, so, so let me say this. You're not making the decision today on, on how we're going to reduce that budget. What we've done is identify what we believe we can reduce the budget for to provide resources to something else. What we are able to do is to actually give you that breakdown. We can send that to the city council so you can see exactly what line items were reduced. Yeah, this purple right here. Uh, it's, 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 it's oh, we have it on the purple and the orange. Yeah. But this is only the programs that actually were reduced. But they don't tell you what line item, but that's what I think was. Uh, right, yeah. Was so I, I know this is in a certain detail, but I guess what I'm trying to say is maybe it's not detailed enough for me to fill? I think you can trust staff with line item managing these budget line items. Yeah. And when each line item is so insignificant and only adds up to 340000 That's That's my opinion. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. I mean, that, that's just, just... I mean, it's not like a program of 340000 going away. Right. It's 3000 year, 4000 year, 3000 year. Right. Which should happen. Yeah, yeah, I, I just, I, 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 we still would be glad to provide the list. <laughs> I'm not going to go get it. You can remember about these. I still want to work. Matt wants to call them. Mark wants to call them. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I have some of the same curiosity that, that you have there, like, uh, you know, because I know, I'll, I'll just give an example here on the community-focused programs. Uh, you know, there's a deduction of $7,500 from emergency management. Yeah, that's correct. Yet, yet I, I know that we need to add a lot more than that. Now, it could be specific. Um, line items or programs that are obsolete or not being used and we take those away and there's other stuff that are Disney. Uh, then the same thing with the EMS operations, it's a flat $7,500 there. Yeah, I, and because I know that we need uh, more funding in the EMS and so uh, it would be good uh, in those circumstances to kind of know. And that's what I'm talking about, exactly that. Yeah. 
okay, I know it's uh, defunding this, right. but what is this? So, yeah. so to, to Martha, to go back to your point, um, in this particular case, it's multiple line items again. Um, there are some where it is only one, like for the mowing contract, for example, um, one program, one, one line, but in some cases, it's several different. It might be a supply, it might be a contractual service, it might be whatever, but it was multiple line items. Yeah. And, and going back to whether this was department initiated, yes, because the departments have to make those choices themselves as opposed to us dictating to them either a dollar amount, or percentage amount, or those kind of things. Yeah, and so so when I when I look at these um, similar numbers for two different line items, then I think that it's more um, percentage based than program based because like I'm looking at community development here and I got one, two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I've got ten lines there uh, of different programs and they all have the same amount deducted which is so, 3353 so so understand that, that some programs are allocated on the basis of some five percentage so if let's just say we'll pick one of those ten thousand dollar reduction in um, you know travel. At, at travel you know and supplies yeah. so um, so in that affected five programs they may have equally or percentage wise one twentieth one twentieth over five programs that's why you're seeing some similarities. And, and I think maybe just some, some kind of explanation of that would, would have been helpful in looking at it, because I'm looking at this and I'm trying to figure out that they must have used percentages or spread uh, spread out over multiple programs the same um, the same experience. And that's a good point. We, we, we took this as here's what we, we think we need to do or what we think we can do for this year to help contribute to you know our future, uh, you know, to meet other needs, but um, but and certainly we can provide the, the list, the specific list to you. But we weren't doing this to think that we were going to get in and identify whether or not you know emergency management you know needed that extra hundred dollars for janitorial supplies. I mean, I, I, I definitely, I get that. I'm not trying to view that. We're just trying to figure out how to analyze the data that we were being given. Sure. It actually might help my cynicism because when I look at this, I go, this was a finance exercise and it was a across the board allocation, and that might be why I have that opinion. Yeah, yeah I, I, where, where if I saw that you were reducing contract labor and it affects these five line items, I might have a little bit more confidence. In this. Exactly. Yeah, and, and to your point, because when I, when I looked at this list, so for a few things like the GD, I didn't see programs, the way I do programs, and these are operations. These are line item budget. These are line item budget. But that doesn't mean that underneath patrol, of course, when I was just looking at uh, yeah. patrol services, you know, had a reduction of $3,500. Maybe that was within a program of patrol services that they did deem was not as effective, which would be, to your point, priority-based budgeting, and that's why they reduced that not line item. So if we knew that little bit more additional detail, because again, these aren't programs except for the GED one and maybe one or two other ones, the rest of them are operational. And there's programs within those operations and maybe that's where that reduction is coming from. Yeah. And, and I would say too, it is possible that as we go through the rest of this exercise in July, there may be some programs we come back to you guys as a policy level discussion. You know, are we prepared to eliminate this function or eliminate that program. And I think that's where we'll have some additional discussion in August. Yeah, I mean, we're spending a lot of time on the 340,000. And keep in mind, guys, that the department heads went through this and said, this is where we can save some money and we need money in some more priority areas. So what we really need to be talking about is the overall shortfall. Not that we don't need additional information on the 340, but that's not the big issue. Um, all right, can we pull up the other, um, the one that's not a picture anymore? Oh, half of it is a picture. Okay, so. Okay, 
So, council, as uh, just make sure everybody knew, we, we rebuilt the slide. Um, it was a picture format. We wanted to add some additional information to it, so we had to rebuild the slide. So, hang on a second. He asked you if you had any other programs you wanted to look at. I think you need to say oh, that. okay. Yeah, I forgot about that. Um, so, I'm actually here interested in what is contained in community awards and crowded spirit, and why is it such a high budget item? Okay. okay. 74,000. Yeah. I asked about that just for that. Oh, you did? Okay, yeah. So, I just looked at that, and I'm like, what? Well, he just asked, you know, what other programs should we look at? And I don't think we back to your comment yesterday. So. Well, my comment yesterday was maximum. I mean, if we're, if we're doing a Spirit of Rowlett Award uh, every month, which we haven't done, we've probably done one a quarter or something like that. But uh, if, we did it, if we did it 12 months, if we did the uh, Smart Yard and, the, uh, and all that, if we did that next month, we would but if we did, that would be 24 of them. And we applied that 24 to that $7,400. So I thought we were $7,000. Per award. Yeah. If we did 24, we don't even have that. Just give him a $5,000 check. I'm yeah. I'm serious. So you'll just be done. I'm thinking maybe it has something to do with staff time. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, so, 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 like so the explanation that I had it's yesterday. Right. I'm remembering it accurately. Is that there was overhead that built into that. that? That's something. It wasn't just the award itself. That, yeah. Yes. That's a big problem. That yeah. is, that's the type of stuff we should be talking about. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. That's another problem. Let me help you with uh, community awards. So of the seventy-four thousand um, dollar budget for that program, fifty-eight thousand of that is staff time. Um, so that's student manager time, community relations manager, community coordinator, creative services, deputy city manager, executive assistant, all contributed to that. So the, the, the remainder of the about twenty thousand dollars is uh, made up for um, uh, regular services and supplies. So community awards, I'm assuming, like the, the uh, annual banquet that. Have. No, this is just the spirit of Rowlett. Well, that's and the smart part. Rowlett, the property of the season. That's well, but that, but city manager is WC manager and nothing, nothing to do with that. But, but still, well, that allocation may have been when the neighborhood life was still under our umbrella. That's one of the programs that we have okay, to do. Okay, that makes sense. From, neighborhood, from city manager's office to community development office. So, so let me say this, and this, is, this has to be worked all the time. You may remember when you went through this last fall or last summer, you know, one of the questions we had is how in the world, why is it costing so much to manage fire fleet, right? And at that time, basically what the chief had done is that, you know, because they, they, they wash them, they clean them, they, they, they check all the hoses every shift, um, and at that point, he had allocated like 5% of every firefighter you know, to that program. Well, you know, they do touch it, but, you know, that's not an $800,000 a year program, you know, and so part of what we've been doing this past year is fixing some of those. So this is uh, where we have, I think, maybe dropped the ball a little bit. We'll go back and make sure whether we did or not, is that if we move the program under another umbrella, we may need to reallocate some of the, um, the supervision, supervisory costs on that too, the overhead costs. Um, okay, uh, did y'all have any other questions on that specifically? So, uh, the other thing that, that Wiki just brought up that, that is a good point. Um, under the this program, uh, there's about, I think, one full staff member that's allocated to that program. Why? I don't, I don't understand that. So, that was one of the reasons we identified this, and, and in my mind at least, an efficiency issue. So. Is that an area we could reduce cost or reallocate somebody back to the street or whatever by you know having a volunteer take that on and manage the program entirely? Maybe one possibility. Um, I don't have an answer for you today, but that's one of the reasons why we identified that program to see if we can actually reduce some of our cost 
um, or repurpose those dollars. I think the way that the salaries are depicted in it are very confusing because I think that they're skewing what the actual cost of the program is. I understand that you're trying to add in the overhead and the street and all that kind of stuff to come up with a million dollar or a hundred million dollar project. So you have to add that stuff in. But the program cost of themselves is significant, significantly less. I mean, the, the VIPS one, per se, but the cost of that program is 5% of what you actually have in there because it's 95% overhead. So it, it's just it's skewing the numbers and making everybody freak out because we're seeing the programs that are $800,000 for uh, fleet maintenance. We know it's not that, but it's all because of personnel costs. Okay, so park that for a minute for me to say this. So let's take crisis intervention. Pretty much everything we're doing is people only. 70% plus of our budget is people. And a lot of our programs are managed by our own people. So I think maybe what you're saying is there's a, uh, you know, there's the direct touch. This is the cost we bought for supplies. This is the person who ran the program versus the overhead side of it which is that person's supervisor and that person's supervisor, that may be the part of it that, um, that maybe there's a way to better explain that or better understand so that, that we can say the direct cost of running that program like VIPS might be less than $10,000, but by the time you stack on overhead, it's gonna feel like it's a lot more expensive. But, but that's, a, that's a valid uh, argument that you I don't know that VIPS is the right example, but if it's costing fifty thousand dollars in overhead to run VIPS and ten thousand in, in hard costs, that fifty thousand in overhead could be allocated to a police officer in the street. So you've got to be able to allocate overhead too. You just got to be able to have the detailed information to make the decisions after that. So I don't think we're saying get rid of the overhead allocations. And certainly with this big of a project and this big of a budget, there's going to be problems with the numbers, you know, we've, we've got to understand that. Um, so. Thank you for explaining that. One last thing. Uh, the accreditation management, $137,000. I know we have an accreditation manager, but I don't think she's paid anywhere near that. No, I think that's probably in place, and that is uh, a full-time person, and again, there's probably a little overhead, but, um, there's a rent cost again, the supplies, the, the services, and things like that are going to be minuscule compared to uh, that. Yeah, I'm just saying that's uh, accreditation management, uh, $137,000. So, so here's one thing we'll, we'll do, and staff, we'll go back to the drawing board to see how we may be able to, uh, to determine like what the direct cost is versus indirect. I think that will go a long way. Some programs, the indirect may be very little, but in some cases, the indirect may be more than the direct, just simply because of who it falls under in the umbrella and all that. Yeah, I think, like Timmy said, I, I think that's a really good idea. Is, um, if you separate that, but also still, so separate it, but also include it, just don't add those two numbers together and say that's how much the program costs. Just say you have the program, the hard cost for this program, is this plus the um, staff member allocated to that program? Is that right? Yeah, no. Direct staffing costs. It's, it's direct costs and overhead costs. So direct costs and indirect costs is the designation. Okay. Right? Yeah. And there's absolutely staffing costs and direct costs. I think I, I think what I was identifying with indirect may be the oversight or the admin uh, overhead. Um, so if, uh, if like crisis intervention, you know, the cost of uh, JJ and Chad is a direct cost along with whatever supplies and services they have, but the sergeant that oversees them or the lieutenant that oversees the sergeant, those become overhead costs that, although we think should be a part of the total cost, I think there's a way for us to help identify what that actually is. So for all the accountants in this room, um, one of the most fun accounting classes you can take is cost accounting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Either you're good at cost accounting or you suck. It's like, ge it's like geometry. Either you're good at it or you suck. I'm not saying you suck, I didn't say that. <laughs> but it's a, yeah. <laughs>
All right, so I think we got our marching orders in terms of that, and then like I said, in August, you're probably going to see us bring back a few of these where we're going to have a policy level conversation with you about. So let's go back now to, to this chart and, um, and to the mayor's point. Under request, I think we were going to change that to options. I must have missed that. I apologize. It's okay. It spells options. Yeah. Dark conditions. And thank you. Okay. So we um, you now have a sense of what our resources are, and you, you spent two days, and you have a better understanding of kind of what we think uh, some of the, the larger initiatives are in terms of cost. And then, of course, there's the portion of this that's one time versus that's not one time. Again, uh, our goal is not to have council, um, you know, say we want to buy that truck or that whatever. But what I do need is whatever guidance or feedback you feel like is important. So in terms of um, let, let's, we're crafting a strategy here, so let, let's just take pain. So if, if realizing that the cost of almost 14 employees is 1.3 million plus some of the equipment we would have to buy on top of that, maybe what we're, maybe what we're doing is to say we have a lot of challenges this year and we have a lot of needs. And some of those needs we're building for two years out when Sapphire Bay opens up. So in the meantime, um, you know, where, where perhaps is the pain point you know, if, if, for example, if we feel like we can't, um, you know, bring pay all the way to midpoint, you know, is there a place that you're willing to say, don't, don't, don't bring us something worse than this? Um, you know, and I, I will just tell you maybe one I know you would say if I asked you this specifically, but, you know, public safety steps, you know, I'm sure you want that in the budget. But in terms of, how aggressive or competitive we are to the market, is there a cutoff point that you would not want to see a budget worse than? You know, is it, you know, is it zero? Is it a half percent off the mark? Is it a full percent off the mark? You know, I mean, we're, we we're do... 1.8 million in the hole on ongoing costs. So I don't, I don't even know that we have that option. It's the, it's the 3.978 versus the 2.140. What is the 3.978 there? On the right. Am I looking at a different? Okay. So, I'm going other and I'm going one time. I don't know why it's split on. Which one are you adding? I mean, are you, I guess you're adding multiple lines to I'm figure that out. One, two, four. I'm looking at Blake's spreadsheet. Which Oh, Blake, you mind sharing your spreadsheet? Well, it has, you just had property, you had the one time down below under the request. On the SharePoint, you have the one time down below. I think Laura yeah. changed yeah. it once what she got it. Like, may not be the most recent because Laura is downloading it to her desktop. Yeah. And okay. altering it and then showing it. Yeah. There's a request to add to change the, the other to ongoing and one time. I know. And one time needs to be down below so that we're looking at apples to apples. Okay. Of oh, yeah. All right. Resources. And that's why it was easy for me to do because I was looking at this version. Yeah. Yeah. So, is that 3977? I can't see that number. Is that 3977? Yeah. Okay. So 3977, and then on the left, is that 2140 up there? Yes, okay. That's what the numbers I'm talking about. Yes. So we have needs of 3978, and we have sources of 2140. Is that equipment 530 uh, one time? Or is it? Yeah, so so the, the well, the some of that equipment, um, yes. Some of the some of the equipment is also one-time equipment. Okay, can you move that down? Well, I think all the equipment yeah. could be one-time equipment. Move the equipment down too, that's, that's fine. Um, so that takes us down to like 3.4. Well, some of the equipment, depending on what staff you agree to, you would need all of that equipment. That's right. But if we do need it, it's going to be one-time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm just trying to get the, the current versus the one-time. Right. And well, what, what if that equipment is? one time up front versus what goes into the 
staff. The, the new staff. Enterprise. Enterprise. Well, no, not all of those. All right. So what's that? What's that number on the right? Three what? Three four four seven. Nine, Three two, four four seven. Yeah. yeah. Five is twenty one forty. Eight. Pretty much. That's a million three. Yep. Yeah. Now we gotta remember. We would not be bringing back every item. This is every item requested. Sometimes we go through several years before we actually fund something or propose to fund it. But this is, you're, you're seeing the total population of all requests made, which was on that, um, that second color. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand what the yeah. recurring versus recurring is. Which was our goal. Yeah. So if we went to a different salary level, so 1.5 would reduce that 300,000 and 1.3 would reduce that 500,000. Okay. I, I think you got to look at, you know, splitting the baby there between new positions and, and salary yeah. increases. Yeah. And that's where I was kind of getting to as I kind of started looking through this is, you know, what is that right now? But like I don't think we need the four new police officers this year because the main issue was to start ramping up the staff in the Santa Mar Bay. That might be able to be delayed here. But if we delay it here, we need eight the next time and then twelve the next time. So you need twelve well, if 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 Sapphire Bay on your current page for Sapphire Bay, I still am not sold that that's the current page for Sapphire Bay. I think Sapphire Bay is gonna longer drawn out build out than what we're anticipating with buys us more years on the back end. So it might be still the four 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 but that whole thing that Chief showed us is it's moved back um, one year. I, I disagree um, because for to me I don't I don't associate that with Sapphire Bay because like Chief said the other day or yesterday is that even without Sapphire Bay we still have only seven officers on the street at a time. And it's in our, the city our size, constantly running calls and having calls in the queue. So I think that comes back to our safety issue in the city. Not, I don't associate with the Sapphire Bay that much. Does this include the specialized team that he was talking about? Yes. So again, um, you know, I'm not, at least I'm not prepared unless council disagrees to propose the special crime unit at this time. No. So, you know, even though, but it is in the list. But it's not in these numbers. But those are the numbers that start to play with, like, maybe we could get away with two officers. additional staff? Yes. And still get so two, doesn't even, two, doesn't, two doesn't give you a position now. It just puts, like, where you pull those yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 officers who were yeah. yeah. special crimes you yeah. 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 out of that yeah. 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 Yeah.
also with the fire um, inspector. Uh, one for the um, IT systems administrators, administrator for uh, public safety, four police patrol officers, one detention officer, the uh, two uh, streets uh, maintenance specialists for the patch truck, and then the 0.5 FTE move a half time custodian to full time. And that's your 13 point. And one detective. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Did that help? Yes, very much. We know you can take these. So I don't know how you cut any of those positions. What do you count? No, well, uh, yeah. for three years. <laughs> three years. Oh, three, three years. years. Yes. With the CARES funding. Yeah. But, but, but no, it, so the account for two positions was paid for through a different fund, not the general fund, for three years. Well, right? Is it in the million three? Yes. So it is. There. Yes. So we can so eighty thousand a year. Mm -hmm. Can come out of that, right? It's for, because the original request we made was out of the general fund, but then when we started to work with Ron, that's when we identified those ARPA funds and it just needs to be moved so out. So it can take 80,000 on it. 80,000. Mm -hmm. 80, yes. Digital media specialists, but I think it's a lot closer. It's a little Do you think with the really? release, it's, it's yes. on the lower end, but 80, yeah, yeah. yeah. we're, we're going to be razor thin. Yes. Because you know why? It's the entry route to a market for a few So, But you've got four room in there. Right, we need to go well, you could do something like four police officers half the way, half the year through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because and that's, the effect, that's the effect of having two. Yeah, because we can't. I, the one time we had, uh, we hired eight officers. Right. One day, we only hired like three by the next year. Of the day. Yeah. Because it take it took time. Yeah, there's a ramp up. So I mean, you can look at all of these positions and go, let's do this in three months, let's do this in six months, let's do this in nine months. You've got to fund it in future years, so you've got to be a little careful. You can just stack the cost of all of here and don't have money again. You've got to be a little careful, but you could do that. So then, um, then I would propose then the four officers would split that. We do two initially, two at the mid year. Is that okay? But if we do, we got to make up the other right. half the following year, right? And we're gonna need four more then. That's another council. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still council, so I'm gonna go for four and a half. Four now. Four four now. So let's do four. I was a joke, it was just a joke. I, I would, I would suggest that for the purposes of today, that you're not ready to make that level of decision. Okay. What, I, what I'm after. We want to support the four. Okay, then let's make sure that's on our list. I support, I support the four. Halfway through the year, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I support the four. I would support the four this year, but Sapphire Bay is not further along. I would support the initial four next year. Right. Okay. That's yeah. fair. Right. Because I still think we're behind in every day. Of the we, we, so I agree with you on that, and that's what Blake sold me on that. But I don't think we need to be ready for Sapphire Bay to be open in, in four years. Right. And have it full of staff. Yeah, right. The training battalion chief, they've been asking for that for so long. Like every year. Oh, for us. Right. right. For five years. Definitely. And we have a training facility, but no nobody assigned to right. work at that facility. So it's kind of like. Yeah, we have a beautiful city and we're not marketing it correctly. So don't talk to me about that marketing <laughs> person. <laughs> all right, all right. She makes a good point. So I would say multiple people are. Um, or, or that. We definitely need the animal services. Yeah. Animal yeah. services. I, I don't, definitely need attention. I don't. I would. Yeah. Cutting any of those that are in that thirteen right yeah. now. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Yeah, I, I like the thought of that, although I think they would have to be a commissioned officer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so I, I think like the discussion yesterday was, do you hire a cop and train them in cybersecurity, or do you hire an IT guy and train them to be a cop? I think that would be much easier to do. Um, I don't understand why they need to be a cop. I'm sorry. We got a whole police department full of commissioned officers that can work hand in hand with an IT person. I, I don't get that. But. I think it would just be more seamless if they were commissioned. It wouldn't mean that they would be a patrol officer, but they would have that uh, Knowledge. authority. I think part of the reason is that we're going to send them to the Ukraine, Ukraine, when you're out of time, so that's why. Send them to what? To the Ukraine. Uh -huh. <laughs> you could learn a lot. Can we separate the uh, cost of the four patrol officers from the one vehicle? That so what we said, any equipment associated with the people we would do out of the one-time money. Okay, so it wouldn't be four seasons. That's correct. But he's already done that in the summary by moving the equipment down here under the one-time stuff. So that's still purely operational. Got it. Thank you. So let's talk about the resources side. So the eight hundred thousand is the current surplus that you think is out there because of property taxes, and that number could go up. It's, it's what we know what we know as of the end of May. Right. And then the million dollars, that is the additional um, uh, taxes we have available as a result of not having to service the debt on Prop B. That's that correct. correct? And, and, and the increment we would have had otherwise for a tax note. And yeah. that was from the previous yeah. discussion. It's basically it's moving I and S to the yes. Okay. And then the ongoing other, you know, that'd be a little hard to dissect right here. That, that's all kinds of things. It's some of the partner requests for additional funding. You know, you heard Joey talk about GIS training. There is the, um, some additional library materials. But it wouldn't be things like playground rehab because that would be in the one time stuff. Yes, I would say so. Well, this is what I'd have to say, Brian. You got some work to do. Got it. Which is that, that, that we can I think we're we'll using this there? as trying to do yeah. August. Otherwise, we don't have August right. if we're going to do it today. You know? Do you think you have enough guidance from us? I know we don't. I do, except, except this. Now, so where, where I think I'm hearing council say is that we, we really want as many of these positions as possible. In other words, this list, you feel strongly enough about that we need to do. Then the question becomes then, um, we can figure out the one-time stuff because we have additional one-time resources available. But in terms of employee pay, then, um, then you're, you're okay with us having to shift or move that around a little bit to try to accommodate as many people off this list as we can. Yeah. And that's the balancing act, I think, Matt. You clarified, I think, if I heard you correctly, the one-time equipment was just equipment that was related to new employees. Mm, I don't know. Not necessarily. The list that way. The truck loader, the work truck loader. It includes it, but it's not necessarily only that. So, like, there was a workman, uh, the, the, the parks and rec. Utility uh, park. That's all yeah. on that 530. Yeah, but that's not associated with a permanent additional person. Uh, okay, I just want to make sure that all of that additional equipment request was captured in that 530. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry. So, as you know, during, during July, we will start to tie down these numbers. So what I'm hearing from you gives me enough direction that we can come back and and our hope is that what we have been able to do, uh, you know, over the, not last year, but in previous years, is that usually there's a little bit of extra money we come to you and say, hey, property taxes came in or sales taxes, something came in a little higher, and then we make last minute changes in the month of August. So. I feel like, Mayor, I have a lot of direction from Council based on this weekend's uh, discussion, and um, I do think you're going to have some additional funds left over at one time, and then, like I said to your uh, request earlier, 
we'll put our heads back together like on the care stuff and then maybe see what else we might be recommend. And I think you need to dissect that out going under that 348. You know, you may pull some out of there, pull some out of um, staffing by staggering it and pull some out of the midpoint. But we didn't really talk in great detail about the 347, but I think you need to look at that in priority to the other two, which is employee pay and employee positions. Because okay. there might be some you can uh, tweak out of there. Um, the one thing I didn't see is anything on the court. And I don't know if there's any budget requests for the court. I don't know. I think it was the only part of the request. That's PDB. That's PDB. There are no general fund additional requests. We did ask, and we do have an answer. We didn't have an assumption. So there's a two thousand dollar request. Oh, the employee appreciation. There was a request for some additional funding for employee appreciation and for a payment kiosk for the lobby, so that you could come in and not actually have to see somebody and be able to pay. But I think that would be try to use court technology. Pay did not. The pay did not meet within our compensation. Um, Plan for the organization as a whole, we, we can tell. Right. Okay. Okay. What else, Brian? What else, Council? Um, my phone's coming now. Can you remind me, and I apologize if I just looked up what we were seeing here, what was on the parts board, the parts bondage at? Um, Bond that they get past the reserve for? It was Herford. The completion of Herford. It was erosion control. Erosion. It was additional work at wet zone. Right. It was the trail, two million in trails. That was it. There was one, there was five. I thought there was some new box trails in Nashville. Oh. I think it was the sports fields. Sports fields. Additional sports field work at community park on the adult softball complex. Yeah. So I think if you can look at those items without negating the vote of the public meeting, don't look at that two million for trails. <laughs> really? Um, and work that into your list of priorities of one time with the one time money here and the one time money repairs. I think that would be a good thing to do. The erosion control. Erosion control. Yeah, because like, for example, at Seaview Point Park, um, we, we may need to do something with that anyway. But that could be a good use of this one. Yes, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's Matt. Or Matt. Good point, Matt. <laughs> Anything else? All right, so last comment for me. I want to thank you for uh, agreeing to give us two days of your time. Um, I know this is, this is a huge uh, endeavor we go through every year, um, and I think that um, you know for all the challenges that we are going to have this year, I think we are going to be able to do some cool stuff, and um, really looking forward to it. So, the Mayor, Council, thank you for your time. Good job, everybody. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Sorry to blow your matter.